And hello everybody, welcome back to Truth Warrior. Today it is Friday, August 14th, 2020. I hope you're well wherever you are in the world. Um, today's show is going to be a fun one. We have a deep dive, literally, where we're going to be talking about everything from ancient history, the idea of fallen angels, the Nephilim, the extraterrestrial question, as well as the underground world. The idea that there's been stuff happening right between our feet, not just for a couple decades, but for possibly thousands of years that many of us don't know about. And I also wanted to bring uh, you on, Michael, to the show. And welcome back, by the way. MichaelTessarian.com is the website. Um, I wanted to bring you back on, Michael, to talk about this notion of evil in a different way than I think a lot of people that come from a religious context uh, really think about it. I've had a lot of people contacting me as of late with all the revelations that are happening all these declassified things that are coming out, all this stuff about, um, you know, these cartels, the human trafficking, the, the trafficking of children, the elites, the secrets. It's all coming out now. It's in the conversation. And people are immediately switching to this question of, well, what could be motivating this? What's behind all of this? All this mystery must have more to do with some kind of spiritual dimensional thing than it does to do with any kind of actual physical phenomena that we might have to address. And this has been a question that you tackle. It's actually your first book, Atlantis, Alien Visitation and Genetic Manipulation, where you tackled this subject, talking about what all these ancient texts are discussing. And we're going to get into some specific terms in a bit, but talking about how uh, there are many different names in all the ancient texts and ancient literature that are talking about the same thing. And it, it must be that way. It can't be that when we're talking about these different beings like the Nephilim and the Anunnaki and the Jinn and, uh, you know, angels, demons, all this stuff. Everybody has their name for it. That They're all in existence in, their, in the way that they're explained. They must be naming something and ascribing some kind of mythos to an actual physical truth that's underlying all of those myths. And that was, that was what your work really stood out to me. It was the first book that I grabbed, and it honestly was a book that changed my life. And right before we get into some of it, I just want to reference people that if you check the description of this video, uh, it'll take you to Michael's site on at his book. And there are loads of appendices that are there for free that you can check out going into pre-Diluvian civilizations, catastrophism, uh, the ancient technology, the Stargate concept, evidence from ancient texts and scriptures, UFO sightings and other anomalies, on and on and on. The giants, the genetic manipulation, the hollow earth. It's just a treasure trove of information. And uh, so with that said, Michael, welcome. And uh, feel free to open up with any opening comments there for people. Oh, it's a great subject. Thank you for 
Dealing with it, inviting me on, because um, the question of evil is fundamental to my work. It's where I basically started, you know, because it's a really good subject to get into because apart from the religious, you know, see, the religion has been the one that traditionally has tried to answer that question. And because people believed so deeply that religion had the answer, priests, in other words, just men, right, calling themselves priests, said, we, we've solved that, we've got the answer. And so even in sociological terms, very little work was done on it. If you think somebody's got the answer, right, buried in that, uh, you know, 60,000 filing cabinets, you tend to think, oh, well, that's it then, it's nailed. You know, and I have a general idea from religion, how evil, you know, come about, Satan and all that. Uh, why should I bother? You know, Dante's Inferno, you know, it's all been answered. And so there's been a dearth of real insight and then it dovetails from there when you when you don't believe that and you say no no i got to pick this subject up i don't believe anything religion has to say about it they've had so much time no way you know garden of eden serpent talking serpents and all that no sorry not going to buy that then you start probing and probing and trying to come up with something and that's where it dovetails into a second aspect of my work which is the uh the statements of mythology which i take extremely seriously right and it doesn't bother me with the sources masonic or actual tribal you know no folklore is truth right just because we don't have the actual interpretive skills anymore right or the pattern recognition or symbolic literacy to decode half of it that's that's not my business is it right uh so you know santa claus and his little gnomes dancing around the christmas tree if that's all you want to see okay but if you want to go deeper right you like we did with the box saga well, now you're graduated and the whole thing opens up. So it's the same with Irish mythology or whatever. And in mythology are different critiques and different explanations for evil than you'll ever find, you know, coming out of religion. That's important too. But then even if you're only dealing with specifically conspiracy, one of the best, I've advocated it for years, one of the best ways into this subject is studying evil. So it's not just a general sociological issue that all mankind can take on in a more of an academic, straightforward, orthodox way. It's one of the best springboards to get into what we would call the conspiracy movement. It's a really healthy way. There are many, many others, right? Studying war, studying the Constitution, studying the Federal Reserve, things we all really know a lot about. But actually, studying the nature of evil is one of the great, you know, routes into the conspiracy theory. But because it's kind of, it takes you into psychology, this is, it didn't work. It skidded off the road and went over the cliff, you know? So uh, my work continues to, you know, uh, harp upon it because I really, I, I know where it's taken me. It took me into my psychic vampirism. You know, it, it loads, loads and loads of areas. But you're quite right. The Atlantis book was the first dip into it. I'm very satisfied with the way that book came out. I had to change almost nothing and, you know, in regards to uh, the general thesis. Because how can you? All modern uh, nonsense on all levels is based in the ancestral trauma of prehistory. So this book deals into prehistory's roots of everything we see today, including government control and the nature of evil. So it's amazing, and it really is. And you, you you're a rare author, I gotta say. Um, I'm not just blowing smoke; it's it's legit that you update all of your books and your articles regularly. So when you wrote this book, I don't know how long ago, back in the early 2000s, you probably compiled it for decades before. But since then, um, you've stopped printing the physical copies because it's much easier for you to just go in and actually edit it in places like Kindle or whatever, where you can update as new evidence comes out, you can go, hey, there's more corroboration for something I said, or, oh, you know what, turns out that maybe wasn't you know, uh, totally bona fide, but this is what is now available for everybody to look at. And it makes it as if we're all a part of this research journey and that's what i like about it is it's like a constant interim report which is the way the, the media should be doing things and the way the historic institutions and the academic halls and the universities should be doing it they're still working off of stuff that's outdated by 50 years or more 20 years or more um stuff coming from the smithsonian and we can get into what's going on with that but you know people like yourself and many of the scholars you reference and people we're going to bring up they are the mavericks. They're the people that are gathering this from a different place. They're looking at it eclectically. They're putting it together so that average people can get up to speed on the actual discussions being had, not just amongst a couple guys sitting on a, on a live stream, but at the topest, top levels of academia, 
theology, the theologian. We, we just did an incredible episode on enslaved, getting into the roots of religion and the priesthoods and all of that. Um, and, you know, so this is constantly growing and evolving. It's not just a stagnant subject, right? Oh, God. My goodness. Each one of these subjects would take a lifetime. Just look. Uh, let me mention three names. You know, L.A. Waddell, Cummins Beaumont, uh, Gerald Massey. That's a lifetime. Each of those men is a lifetime because of where it's going to lead. I, I deal with hundreds of guys like that. But you're quite right. You see, uh, because because uh, the subjects are so controversial, uh, and, and maybe I will have hardbacks down the line. It's certainly an option. Uh, things are coming easier. and everything. But yeah, I've chosen to do it with a Kindle because of the constant updates. Do you know I'm inundated, you see, with other people's contributions? I mean, Jockey Hackstrom, the guy never leaves me alone. You know how much stuff he's contributed alone? So I have a special hotline to the guy, right? You know, or Caleb or whoever, right? I mean, Jesus. And then and, and you see how far, you know, how far their research has gone. It's incredible. Do you think I could do it all? I re need that. And then, yes, some of them are, some parts go onto the appendices pages. Mostly it's where the updates you're speaking about go. But there's sometimes a contribution that is so precious. It's got to go in the Atlantis book or it's got to go in the Irish origins. And that is absolutely impossible if you print them in paperback. Because you have you know stacks and stacks of them at some fulfillment house or whatever you know, and the publishers don't want to change anything, and it can change all the formatting if you do, and all this nonsense. So no, I want that in there. You know that's got to be in there, and I've done that. And then what I do is I also put all the links of modern science findings on the websites. They're there because just just in case anyone tries to tell us we're all tinfoil hat wearers, well, there's two things that come out really really important, and that one is on a good day science has corroborated most of everything that a Beaumont or a Waddell and those other people have said, but you wouldn't know where to find it, right? National Geographic have already proved catastrophism, by the way, but how would any of our listeners know where to go and clinch and prove that, put their hands on the facts? The facts are actually there. So it takes somebody like myself, you see, to collate it. I've put the links on the Irish origins and other sites, so it's there at hand, so you can prove that many things even this last month, they proved things about the Irish, you know, underground passages. Uh, they found some details about DNA. They have corroborated, right? And then the other important fact in subjects that we deal with is that in general, and this even goes for, you know, stuff on, uh, say, uh, determinism, uh, you know, intelligent design, all sorts of subjects, right? Is that the people who now are the experts in looking at this alternative way, alternative, whether it's like a Walter Russell style, you know, paradigm or whatever, are all way more smart than all the materialists and determinists. That's a fact. They're academically higher up the totem pole, you know, Charles T. Tarks, right? The Ian McGill Christ, <laughs> right? The Robert Lanzas. So we have a materialism has is itchy. It's problems. It's got lots of breakouts. It's weaker than it's ever been because everyone who now dabbles in an alternative paradigm is smarter academically than all the Joes that we had to labor under, you know, for, for almost a hundred years. And I can cite and cite and cite and cite that for a fact. But you only need to quote one guy, Ian McGilchrist, right? Neuroscience. So the materialist paradigm is crumbling. So in a way, these updates that somebody like me would do to a book or, or on any of these subjects, it's imperative that it gets out in topical time because the whole edifice of materialism, right? The narrow edifice is crumbling. So I have to then, you know, more articles, more work. Instead of less and, you know, kicking back, put out more because this is the time. You want those paradigms out now. You know, uh, and I have my way of doing it. Other people have their way of doing it. We're doing it right now on this podcast. So there's no time like the present. We People like us have prayed for this moment, you know, where people are not only open-minded, but you can verify it by uh, eminent sources, whether it's religious naturalism, whether it's emergence theory, where it's novelty, where there's holographic theory. This is the time to prove it before some of these shell drakes are dead and gone. You see, as, if we wait, then I mean, McGill Chris is gone from the world, right? Nobody's heard of him again. You know, uh, uh, Charles T. Tart, there's men who are now in their 60s, Anthony Peak. you know, tomorrow they'll be gone again. I'm, I'm really, really aware of, of the deadline and the timeline. Doesn't mean you go into panic, but you succinctly and determinist, you know, you read their works and you try to make slides and you put little memes out and you promote their books as much as they can because they're alive now. Ralph Ellis is alive now. He can defend, he can physically defend his work. It's a very strong ground to be on, and we must use that as, as our advantage. Oh, I couldn't agree more. It's really important. And that's why I want to do also as many podcasts with you as I can, because you're one of the people that has spent your life collecting these works. 
at a really high level. I mean, there's people that do a great job, um, but you know, when you spend this, you kind of dedicate your life to it, the, it shows. And when, when people are listening right now, we're gonna go through things in this show that might make you go, what, is that even possible? Don't just take our word for it. There's only so much we can cover in something like this. Go look at all the sources that we're gonna provide. Take some notes of the names that we're mentioning and that Michael throws out at you. Um, and we've, I've, part of me wanted to do this for the beginner as well. Uh, there'll be stuff for the beginner, there'll be stuff for people that are at the advanced level of this kind of research, but there's so many people now re reaching out to me literally from all over the world. Um, I really feel like this whole lockdown thing has triggered something. Uh, it has to do with the astrology as we've talked before, the timing, but there is something happening where there's this curiosity again and people are saying, hey, I've been deceived about uh, the medical establishment. I've been deceived by the media. I've been deceived by the politicians. We're, we're getting that. We've been deceived by Hollywood. We've been deceived by all this stuff. Um, but what I want to tell people is this isn't something new that just because you've just figured this out now, that now it's like, oh, well, yep, there's a couple of conspiracies that we just got to wrap up and then we can go back to normal. Remember, this is ancient. The lies that we've been told have been with us for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And there is a whole world of things literally happening on this planet and off planet that I think, you know, would be worth considering as we dive into this. So I just wanted to open up with a couple passages from your book, Atlantis, to sort of open up the, the discussion here. This is a quote we've brought up. You've brought up many times. It's right there on the site. It comes from the Popol Vuh. And it's very, very interesting. It says, let us make him who shall nourish and sustain us. What shall we do to be invoked, to be remembered in the earth? We have tried with our first creatures, but we could not make them venerate us. So then let us try to make obedient, respectful beings who shall nourish and sustain us. So that's a quote you carried around for a while, Michael. Uh, any quick comments on that one? Yeah, well, uh, you have many things to say. There's another quote from the Popol Vuh. Uh, I think it's on the same page. The refrain, there's a Sumerian quote. Uh, but when it comes to Sumeria Babylon, it's quite extensive. If you go into the chronicles of uh, uh, Nintu, right? How Nintu created the world. It's also Anana, in other words. But, you know, Babylonian, Akkadian, Sumerian are all based on the same sort of, you know, mythos. And so there's there's reams we went into it in the female illuminati where i have a lot more extensive quotes of the actual creation by way of a, you know the lady of the rib ninti right on decoding all of that that turned up in the in the genesis you know in a more garbled form uh you know you're talking snakes uh, man creating eve <clears throat> how that's possible we still yet to work out but see it's all inverted right it, 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 this is what you do when you're dealing with dramas and stories. But you're quite right. From the Popol Vuh, see, the Popol Vuh is only one codex of hundreds and hundreds that were burned. So people go, oh, that's interesting that, you know, yeah, it's more interesting why the conquistadors, namely Christians, burned all, all of the works of these, you know, Maya and Aztecs and people like that. And because they had reams and reams and reams of information on this. And it was uh, thought works of the devil and they burned it. So you have to then, as you said, do what I've done, which is go through, you know, the records of the world and pick it out and then interpret it correctly because there's also alternative interpretations of a lot of this stuff as well. But the role of the female always interested me in this, the role of the goddess, it's stark right in your face when you deal with the Babylonian stuff, you know, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Enuma Elish, we'll put the links, you know, uh, another one called the Atrahasis, which is one of the earliest. And that was carried by the Sumerians. But well, Waddell believes that uh, L.A. Waddell believes that the Sumerians were not indigenous to that area. They were actually Hittites, right, from Turkey. You know, uh, Turkey being a huge Aryan bastion, a, a major empire there, and they had earlier sent another group of the same racial people had gone to Sumeria. So Sumeria suddenly and uh, Babylon, you know, Sumeria and uh, what am I uh, Turkey, Anatolia, which is part of the West, by the way. A lot of people don't realize this, but geologically, anthropologically, bot botanically, Turkey is a Western country. It's not part of the Middle East like it was reconfigured later, right? So these great Aryan empires, and then, of course, his other work on Egypt. So there's a triumvirate, you see, between Egypt, Anatolia, that's Turkey, and Sumeria. And all of these mythos, mythos, mythologies come out of that, that one Aryan culture. And they're very, very revealing. Um, and, of course, in Turkey, they found one of the deepest and largest underground tunnel networks in existence, right? Uh, you know, at this uh, Cappadocia. 
uh, and they've also discovered extraordinary you know things in the east in babylon you know in the sumerian culture particularly the idea of a garden a sacred garden with a sacred tree right so all of these things prefigure what turned up in the bible you know uh, and they found also books right so i go to the most eminent uh, scholars like kramer you know noel kramer noah kramer one of the most eminent people academically and uh, quote from his book see there's so many thousands of books you can quote from right but i try to go to the most academically sound because you know i know what i'm up against i know you know that people are oh, you're talking a bunch of shit yeah but is he talking a bunch of shit then i didn't ask you to believe me believe this guy right they're the ones that agreed they dug it up so this is the you know you have to use this technique because some of the information is so far-fetched you know what it does for our timeline what it does for you know history prehistory right so yeah it, it's just a fascination but i must say again as i've said before it's my interest in today's world that got me interested you know if we start talking now about history and prehistory people sort of glaze over and tune out oh no no i am interested in those things even my own country's history prehistory because i'm interested in what's happening right now in the streets and the consciousness of moderns that has to be emphasized so you know people shouldn't glaze over and like, oh another history lesson sure i know all about that you know it's pertinent to everything that's happening today evil has not just you know a sell by date you know where it's over it's done it's, it's cleared it's getting more we've had 13 since ad there's been 13 years of war for one year of peace wouldn't it be nice to change that round <laughs> no we've got plenty of starting places we got plenty of, yeah 13 years of war and conflict for the one year of peace and people say well we're modern we're progressive we know it's, we're technological oh yeah think again well, and that's why you got to go back into history and really dig it up. And speaking of Turkey, um, right now, our back, the background image I chose for this is actually in a place called Derin Kuyu, which I believe is that underground city that you have. And I have a little write up to go through some of these different places uh, to talk about the underground nature of the world. The fact that there's an entire underground that most people maybe have heard little bits here and there. Um, people have heard of things like deep underground military bases, you know, you know, there's all these types of things, Cheyenne Mountain, Groom Lake, S4, all this stuff. Um, I'm going to go through some of those. But what I wanted to show in this is that none of that is new either. Digging massive complexes in the earth, under the earth, has been something that has been an ancient practice that's been done all over the world. Um, and also there's tons of myths and legends of these caverns and the discussion of advanced beings coming from within the earth to give wisdom or even start wars or whatever. There's all these stories of beings coming out of the earth. Um, and there's also stories of beings coming from the sky. So there is this sort of above and below sequence that's happening, earth being in the center. And when you get into the myths and legends, it's just amazing how ubiquitous it is everywhere that you have variations of the same themes. So then my question has always been, well, is there anything to it or is it just a bunch of campfire tales? And as you've said, no, the myths and legends, you have to understand how to decode what's being said. Um, there, it, there's truth to what's being said. And also there has been this sequestering and burning of history that's been done by all kinds of religious priest classes and groups and elites and monarchs. And so we need to understand that. So just to kind of give an idea here, I wanted to talk about this idea of the fallen angels. And this uh, was inspired by somebody that was trying to contact me and trying to discuss this from the Christian context, which, you know, fine, that's one way of looking at it, right? Is that you've got this character named Lucifer who was at the fall, the right hand of God. He betrayed the heavens and then was cast down, you know, into this place called hell or Hades. And then, you know, we ha he brought some of his angels with him. And so when you look at it from the biblical standpoint, it's this idea that, well, there's these spirits, these old, ancient, demonic spirits that fell spirits that fell from the heaven that have cursed the earth and are now dominating the earth and that's who these elites in hollywood are sacrificing children to and that's who this whole blood ritual is all about is these mythical spiritual interdimensional beings and i'm not discounting the fact that there's other dimensions we can't see or understand or energies or however you want to look at it but i'm i don't know what it is i've just always been more of a nuts and bolts guy with this and i know you have too where it's like well let's get into see if there's a physicality to this idea, there's actual, we're talking real beings here coming from above or coming from below or a combination of both, you know, like Jack Berenger said. Um, and then if we understand it from that standpoint, 
I look at it from the standpoint of the human being. I have a physicality, I have a mentality, and I have a spirituality. So I have many dimensions to myself. So why then wouldn't these beings operate in that same reality? Why, do, why are we always casting the extraterrestrial question into this mythical place that we can't understand? And then when you said the psychology, my thing says, well, maybe the psychology is that that is so traumatizing to the human being to say, oh, what? I'm not the top of the food chain. I'm not the highest creation or whatever. There's something else that's been a part of that that's above me. There might even be predatory forces, interspecies predators and all these kinds of things. That's a shock to the psychology of most people who would rather live in the comfort zone of I'm at the top king of the world. I'm untouchable. I'm out of the food chain. There's nothing above me. And whereas I think we're living in a much more complex universe. So that said, let me just pull up this quote uh, from the opening pages of your Atlantis book and uh, we'll go through it here. So what you're saying here is that information from ancient legends convinces this writer that the visitors, for all their intellectual acumen and technological expertise, were warlike and corrupt. In our opinion, the alien renegades took refuge on earth, were considered gods, and took full advantage of the relative credulity of their hosts. Having no love for the peoples of earth, they sought to enslave them. And it is our opinion that they were successful, and that we cannot have a thorough understanding of human history until we take the question of alien colonization seriously. So for some people, that might be far out, and they'll go, what? That seems like a script from like Dune or some Star Trek or something like that. But there's a different story here, isn't there, Michael? Yeah, and I'm only I'm only iterating and condensing and summarizing what these leg legends are talking about, right? Because they do exist. Um, and the Book of Enoch, you know, is is one of the major sources. But you have the Bur Book of Baruch. You know, all the I, I make sure that all the texts are there, even obscure texts, you know, like from the Mahabharata and all, uh, to support the case. It doesn't mean it's true. It doesn't mean there's not other alternatives, right? But the one thing that you said correctly is that, yeah, we have to distinguish. Say say you do take on the fact that the Nephilim are archonic beings that came to this planet. You're still left, because you mentioned Christianity earlier and Lucifer, right? You're still left with a marked controversy as to whether these beings are flesh and blood, like say Star Trek, Vulcans, very superior, you know, a race like that. But there's no question of any supernaturalism. These are beings that live on other planets, you know, other other solar systems. And it's they who, over time, developed the technology to roam the skies, you know, and then uh, that's the kind of being. I think that's very easy to think about and frame. And just because we haven't found any intelligence out there yet, that's a whole separate subject. It's far easier to, you know, imagine that they would be. Because here we are with a phenomenological proof. Here we are on a planet, you know, what on earth, right? So there's that controversy as to the Christian simply refuses not all because there's a lot of great christians in in this ufo movement who've opened their minds to, to the extraterrestrial thing by the way but the hardcore literalist is going to always say, oh it's supernatural i know exactly what that's all about book of book of enoch and all oh i that's that's spiritual beings lucifer satan they fell from heaven that's just metaphorical these are demonic beings you know i've seen them at the anime bed as well they're in they're angels they're fallen angels that's why it says that right and translations be damned, you know, the word Archon, the word Nephilim, they go back and forth. Everybody's got their own interpretation and everybody should have their own interpretation. You know, we just don't need somebody uh, telling us that we now have to go along with one narrative, right? You know, that, that, that some of the hardliner Christians want us to do. And then what happens is the serious person, the people I write for, are those who've given it thought to say, is there any substance to anything about the supernatural in general? Take away the Nephilim. What about this idea of supernaturalism? That any, there could be even angels, good angels, positive angels, the, the Lucifer, the archangel, who are they? Who are the archangels and the angels? And you know, all this, it goes, even when you get into Kabbalah and Gnosticism, it goes on and on and on and on, what they call these uh, archonic uh, levels, you know, uh, three, 10, 12, seven, you know, it goes on and on and on. There's whole schools of Christianity that believed in all of the supernatural stages. You know, with the, the Demiurge and all of that. So some, sometimes somebody gets, you know, a little uh, curious and wants to know. And then they pursue the question that is so many peoples in our world believe from ancient times on about supernatural. Um, because, because the kind of entity that you're talking about, right, who can be summoned in a supernatural sense, you know, your magic circles and all of that, and your rituals and your conjurings and your sacrifices is a very different entity, obviously, than the ones that kind of, mentioned there about evil warlike beings coming from another planet right and just it's just 
I wrote the book because my slant is that it is physical. It's, ter it's terrestrial and extraterrestrial. Who the hell, you know, I just can't see in my mind who else would want to bother with, with taking the earth and needing it and needing its resources and its commodities or enslaving the peoples of the earth. The ancient texts talk about enslavement. But to me, that already counts out any kind of supernatural. Why would a supernatural, arconic being, who's a, who's a supernatural, angelic being, want to enslave the human race? Or need a planet? It's like Captain Kirk. What does God need a starship for? You know, and maybe there's answers to that from somebody else. Maybe the Christians have got, you know, got great answers to that. I, I don't, I, I'm not, it's not convincing to me. So, But the other side is convincing. Right, and just like they said, and the ancient man saw a machine working perfectly, he thought it was magic. Right, so ancient man redacting myths, hearing what the ancestors had to say to him about a lot of things, could easily in some sort of a trauma, traumatic state or semi-traumatic state come up with the idea of a supernaturalism, right? And then everybody else sort of went with that, but it doesn't mean it's true. And I'm saying that one needs to then, you know, weigh in with the concrete evidence. Texts of the past tend to have a lot of this posy. They tend to have a lot of this uh, fantastical elements. But I've learned that you need to see through those. So the, what the Christian's doing is taking these fantastical elements and he's just taking it literally, like he does. That's why I call them literalists, Christian literalists. They're taking the Bible literally, right? Well, then you're with Muhammad, who flew to heaven on a horse, took out a big scimitar and cut his horse in half, right? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Really happened, right? And all the other things that really happened. You know, the 600 wives, the man who lived for 800 years in the Bible. Suddenly you're taking a lot of things literally. So, you know, we do have that school. That school is still with us. But it, it, just, it just didn't work for me. So when I'm reading these chronicles and reading the book of Enoch and all, I've trained myself just to say, look, you know, let's think of it in hard terms. The Garden of Eden is the Arctic homeland. It really existed. The, the, the polar shift right uh changed consciousness there was physical trauma on this planet that affected consciousness the nephilim are lords and in fact one of the actual secondary meanings of nephilim means king lords of this world okay so there's substantiation all the way along the line for that for that aspect of it oh yeah you got that yeah yeah it was just as you're saying it i mean we've heard this term the nephilim and in the book you you basically have the breakdown here you've got the word nephilim apparently means those who were cast down the name has the following secondary meanings of giant, lord, king, ruler. And some scholars believe the word derives from nephal, meaning extraordinary or extraordinary men. And it probably derives from the verb napal, meaning fall or fallen ones. It may also connote beings who cause a moral fall. And then you have a, a really great write-up that you, you told me even before the show. You know, you've double-checked it and triple-checked all the definitions of these um, these are the many names that have come down to us from various traditions describing the same thing, describing these visitors, something otherworldly. And they include things like the Anunnaki, the Anakim, the Rephaim, the Fallen Angels, the Watchers, uh, the Lai, the Serpent Race, uh, Amarka, Nagos, um, Makshasos, I can, sorry, the Jinn, the Jedi, the Gregory, the Titans, the Elves. The Illies, we've done whole presentations on that for hours and hours. It's amazing. The Prometheans, the Olympians, the Asuras, the Dragon Kings, and the Rayless Ones. All from different authors, all from different, you know, it's just to, uh, to realize that a lot of mythologies, by the way, you know, mention all of this. The Mahabhatra certainly does, the Ramayana, you know, some of the great legends talk about the giants and yeah, there could be absolutely a case that some of the giants are just physical beings, but then you do have these texts. And then when you think about all the texts, like the apocryphal works, the book of Enoch is an apocryphal work. Well, it wasn't the only one, right? In the book of Jasher and the book of Baruch, when you show those appendices on the little Atlantis page I have, people can go in there and see. There's lots of accounts of this. And so you're going to say, are they supernatural? Are they terrestrial? Are they some drug image right you know uh people high as kites on the mushroom cult saw beings that they took for you know like i say you know succubi incubi we've got to look at it all and that's what i do that's why I, uh, still we're talking about it today that book was written in 2000 and it was probably it, there was a bunch of pirating happened of the drafts uh but the real book came out about 2002 actually i think it was about february no excuse me what i'm talking about it came out more like about march 2002 in addition you know that i could be mildly happy with right after all these pirate and jobs 
uh, didn't didn't know how the internet was working back then, right? What what a terrible thing it can be in many ways. But uh, uh, you bet, you bet. I've, uh, everything in there has been double, triple checked, right? It's not asserting any point of view, but what it's doing, like all my work, is it looks at a phenomena like the Garden of Eden or the Genesis story or the Book of Enoch. It looks at it from as many perspectives as you can get that are alternative. You know, some of them so radical that I, 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 you know, I'm not apologizing to Christians, but I do understand. I understand why they'll run a mile. I really do, because when you start talking about the serpent in the garden as being a force of good, and there's a, there's textual evidence for that as well. Uh, you know, the average Christian literalist is incapable, right? Their minds are, are cased in concrete. I know that. I know that before I wrote it. I knew it years before I wrote it. And you're quite right. The research for that book does go back a long way, right? Uh, but it was stimulated by one line in a book by Jack Barringer called Past Shock. And that stimulated, you know, it was, I was looking around a way, for a way to collate. It was about 1999, 2000. These notes that I had, and several uh, several things happened during that year, right? Uh, but without Jack's book, uh, yeah, I don't think it would have come together. That one line is the catalyst that brought all uh, you know all the uh, sundry things together, which I, would have been a real task. It would have been a really monumental task, and it would have been the first and last book I ever wrote. But suddenly, you, I found that match that lit up the darkness, and all the pieces automatically came together with relative ease, actually. So you know, yeah, and I dedicate the book to Jack and I met him in person, you know, and. Uh, congratulated him for that and still do because you know he he had he had formulated the thought about the consequences of the natural trauma you know he had his expression of it and he didn't do it he didn't do it at length but it was just one little caption or one paragraph that oh my god that's it and i could hang my hat on that and, and i went to town and and it's never stopped since then i've never had to retract that or i think if anything it's even continued it to um, unpack and it'll go on and on and on. There's no end to this. This stuff has the most extraordinary, right? You know, uh, ripples in the pool that never end. You know, I've just kicked. I've just kickstarted the subject that will go on and on and on. Many permutations for many, many years. Well, and it needs to. I mean, if the goal is to find the truth, just because we jump into something that appeals to us, like you know, some priest bangs you over the head with a book and says, "This is all you need to read." This is the um, an indisputable, indisputable word of the God, the creator. And then you go to a different religion and they'll say the same thing and a different variation. No, nope, they were wrong. These guys are right. These, when you get into it, that was what woke me up to it was I said, okay, I was raised as a Christian. I understand it. There's a lot of things about Christianity that I like other things that I didn't, didn't resonate with me and forced me onto a lifelong pursuit of these questions. Um, and I've interviewed rabbis, monks, priests, uh, from different religions. I've had debates with people. I've listened to debates at the theological level, the atheists, you know, all that. And you just kind of start going through it all. And you say, okay, as you said, with just sort of somebody picking up a book, reading it, going, wow, this is the truth. You got to say, well, who wrote that book? Who, who picked the passages that were going to make it into that book? Who translated those passages? Who was in charge of that? Who had more literacy in the times that those books were written than the people that were meant to be the believers of it, right? What kind of an advantage did the priests, the, the rulers, the people who commissioned these texts, who edited these texts, you know, the Constantines, the, all these people, you know, who, the Josephuses who were writing as the historians, we've gone to that with Ralph Ellis and you go on and on. And then the university levels that they're sort of commanding the historical record and the archeology span departments, and they're editing things and burying things and shutting down research projects and getting rid of people and you know writing articles to slander them. It's such a tangled web. And for me, that's a sign that there's a lot more to the story of human history and what's happening now than what you can just pick up by going, oh, I just found a book. This guy said something makes sense. I'm going with that. And then you're told, just use faith. Just reuse your faith. You, you believe in it blindly. We've got it. This is the end of the story. But if you do what you do, which is considered to be blasphemy, blasphemy by the religious mind, is to go, I'm going to be illiterate. I'm going to make myself literate, symbolically literate, uh, understanding the, the names and the terms and the phrases and what are meant, different ways of looking at it. I'm going to analyze and compare different religions. That, that used to be you know, something you could never do. You can't compare and contrast with other religions because then you're, you're betraying your religion. But the thing is, the truth, as we said before, it's the truth that's always right, and it could be truth against the world. If it turns out that there's elements of truth in it, but it doesn't quite pin down the actual story, and you need to go elsewhere to understand that, 
then it means there is an exploration to be had. And that's, that's a lifelong journey. So that's where I come in and I go, okay, how can we validate this? We've got these myths and legends. There's also the mind of person that will say, none of this matters. The religious stuff is hogwash. The mythology stuff is hogwash. You're reading these texts and interpolating it as ancient beings and all this stuff. There's that mind as well. That's just completely critical um, of everything. But no matter what, we're still coming back to this framework of the question of the origins of human beings. We don't even know our origins. We don't understand what's been going on on this planet. So it's a question. And that's all we're trying to do here. And I just wanted to say then that this brings us to the actual evidence. Okay, So when you know that there's been as you said, apocryphal works. For people that are new to this, that means books that were cast out of the final cut, the King James Version and all of that of the Bible. And there's been apocryphal works from other religious traditions as well. That's just left over from what was actually burned, destroyed, or even sequestered. I mean, what do they got in that 50 miles of tunnel, tunneling underneath the Vatican? What do they have in other places that we don't even know about? Um, what are in the private collections of some of these very, very uh, elite, high, powerful people in these Masonic lodges or whatever? What kind of information do they have that they're holding back from the public that would actually answer some of these questions, right? So it's a journey that's a lot more complicated than just picking something up. The Jehovah's Witness knocks on your door and tells you this is the way to go. And you are in a position of choice where you have to go, well, I guess I need some answers in life, so I guess I'll go with that. I need a community. I need someone to worship. I need something to do. I need reassurance that when I die, my life had meaning, so I'll go with you. Or you say, thanks, I'll take the book, as I've done. I'll read it. I'll look into it. I'll go look at the Mormons. I'll go look at all these people. I'll compare notes, and I'll form my own opinion. If that's a sin, you got to start asking yourself, which groups benefit from making that process of personal exploration a sin? You know what I mean? Yeah, it's authoritarianism. And the book can look at the Sikhs, look at the Muslims. Uh, the book can become the authority. But <clears throat> nobody said it's authority. If you read the Guru Granth Sahib, right, of the Sikhs, it never stops telling you don't take the book as an authority. For hundreds and hundreds of years, Sikhs have taken the book as an authority. It says it over and over again not to do that in the book. So you're, you're back to psychology, you know. <clears throat> and by the way, when you go to the folklore, you know, again, they are one of the archives that I think preserves this when all of this other stuff was burned. They left it alone, didn't they? Folklore, folklore, right? That was their mistake. So when you go to it, right, what generally comes under the heading of folklore contains everything we, we want to know. But in the folklore, there are anecdotes about supernaturalism. Don't get me wrong, right? There are, uh, there, just as there is about magic and, and uh, magical weapons and all of this, right? Uh, it's in Tolkien, it's in even the original myths that he was extremely expert at analyzing. But there's also the concrete evidence. There's the dolmens, there's the pyramid, there's the sarcophagi that nobody can bloody budge or move or even wonder how they get carved out. You know, dealt with that a little bit in the last article. But by the, go to your email, there's a, a book I just sent you after the after the one there's another link i sent it's a wikipedia to etadorfa can you show that because you were talking about there about ways in for people who are very new to this and a little bit uh, you know uh, maybe uh their ground isn't as strong you know there's fictional masonic right etadorfa by uh john lloyd pick that book up it's a little book written by uh, an author right american businessman and that book is full of whistleblowing elements and it's openly masonic right and in the course of reading that it's just fiction so you know again don't worry we're, we're here to show the way right say here's a few pointers and go down that road and if you don't like it turn back in lloyd's book you get many things there is anecdotes about the mushroom cult uh the whole book is about underground you know uh world the hollow earth it's one of the best fictional books ever written on the hollow earth by the way the word etadorfa which is you know description of the hollow earth is is aphrodite backwards so there's even goddess cult symbolism involved in this right and one of the first underground cities and railroads i think it's in either china or japan it's been so long i can't remember but i do i think have a, mentioned it in the book the first thing you see when you descend on the uh, conveyor belt you know the, the staircase down into this under one of the biggest underground cities in the world is a statue of, of venus aphrodite so but John Uri Lloyd was way ahead, right? Interesting. But one thing he, yeah, one thing he does 
In the course of that book, you find out how many tunnels are under Georgia and particularly under Kentucky. Thousands upon thousands of caves there. Now, people who visited some of them, you know, on holidays know this. Uh, there's some of the very, very famous ones there. But lit even people who visited those caves may not be actually aware of how perforated Kentucky alone is the state. So we have the physical evidence, you see. So none, I have never based anything on wild speculation. Even in the early 80s, you know, when I looked into these things first, it was very, very important that substantiation. So when I looked into, say, this is just an anecdote on the side. If you're looking at the Battle of the Boyne, yeah, and then you go and look at the hard evidence and find that they haven't found a single fucking bullet, musket ball, or a belt buckle, you know, because when you have a war, you'd usually find a musket, a rifle, a spear, a spearhead, a bullet. They find one lousy bullet, you know, uh, it's in the, it's one of the museums down there, one piece of information. Well, that's evidence that the Battle of the Boyne didn't take place. So on the other side, you have as well. So as you said earlier, there's been deceptions about things that we take for granted about the history of the world. And when you go and dig into it, you find it's absolute nonsense. But then the mythologies also have proof, the, the exact reflection of that. Things that you've taken as completely airy-fairy pie in the sky. Many Christians have done this and many people have done this in a secular world. Wrong. Because there's actual evidence supporting that. Do you remember in the book, maybe we can touch on this later. Remember in the Atlantis book, I, I, I dealt with all of this stuff, but because I was trying in the latter part of the book, I think it is, where I wanted to get into the whole question of the methodical ley line issue and the dragon paths and what are even synchronic lines, which are even more important than that. And then I wanted to get into that whole story, which is evidence, right? Every geomancer worth their salt know that, and many mainstream people even know this. But I brought up the idea that there was underground, you know, tombs, let's say, call them that for now, where the burial places of some of these fallen angels, if you want to call them that, the Nephilim, the Archons, right? There is actual uh, physical evidence of this. And the government right, of different countries have been digging this stuff up for their own nefarious, uh, you know, necromantic purposes. So there's there's a whole tie into this that is very very important because in these few locations where these beings are put and their government symbolism is, is it doesn't stop telling you about it and in, in, in very famous movies and also in ad copy they 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 refer to this I had reams and reams and reams of proof of this on an early blog right but the point to make now is that wherever these beings were placed became toxic areas in the world geomantically speaking a subject you can go and study. A layman listening to us can go out and go to one of these places and see if the energy is good. Head off to Belfast, right? Go to Dublin, go to, uh, you know, Beirut or wherever, right? And, and hang around the places that are war-torn, that have a particularly negative energy, and see for yourself the difference between... Go to even a dwelling. Forget about buried Nephilim. You should know the difference between a place that just is an old ruined house that doesn't feel good as opposed to somewhere where you know that good thoughts were thought and good people lived there and there was happiness. You can tell the difference. So it's kind of on that level that, you know, a lot of my work is dealing with. But it, but there are proofs because these ley lines, the way to get the proof for the things like that, don't want to spend too long on this, but the assassination of JFK, why was it on the 33rd Meridian? Why are different banks and homes of the state, you know, the stately homes of these great, great families on the 33rd meridian and the 30th meridian and so on? So you have to undertake a lifelong study, but not everybody is Scott Onstott that's going to go out there and methodically map the earth to find out that every statue, every column, every state building, every uh, civic, you know, edifice, the divine mathematics, the same that's in the Ark of the Covenant and the pyramid is there. You're going to tell me that's not evidence, that's an accident? That individual architects, some layman is going to tell you, oh, it's just an accident, to the degree, right? And, and we could go on, we could have podcast after podcast after podcast on that alone. That's part of masonry, by the way. And America was designed on that. Paris is designed on that, right? To not only parody Egypt, as many of the layman writers think, and they're wrong. It's not just a parody stuff that was going on in Egypt. What, what lies behind Egypt? What lies behind Egypt is Atlantis and the, and the pre-Diluvian period. So uh, that geometry of the pre-Diluvian races and the pre-Diluvian people mattered so much to these fallen angels that they wouldn't build a city. Now, how many people are here are aware of why higher beings would care about geomancy and not even frequent or build the great cities without bearing in mind 
this astral cartography and then terrestrial cartography. Are you going to tell me this accident? If it's accident, I'll buy you a ticket to René Le Chateau. You can spend two weeks out there and come back and tell me there's no sacred geometry in the world and has no relevance to any elites. If the fucking Knights Templar's major bastion in the West is in a, and that's not the only place in Portugal and other places, Drogheda, come to Drogheda, you've been to Ireland, right? The thing is a Templar skull from the air. You can, the whole town is based in Templar geometry and one of the most important priories. I could go on for years on the stuff like this. So there's evidence because if it's, if it's good enough for your masters and you don't know anything about it, I don't want to have your conversation. You're wasting my time. The Cistercians, the Templars, the, the ty different different orders had these salt lines, which are basically ley lines that networked England. If they didn't exist, then why do all the stately homes of the Sinclairs and the De Clares and the, you know whoever you got are precisely placed on the vertices of that network? Proven fact. Masons have even written books proving it. Men, like I said, eminent men like Schwala de Lubitsch and some of their disciples have proved it. His daughter and other things. So it's not a matter of conjecture and it's non-negotiable. So that already is a way into knowing geometry, earth geometry and earth geomancy is important. And I included that in the book because you want to develop what you're reading in these books of Enoch. You want to try and restore or guess what, remember what we said all about that burned codexes and text, text. It's our job to speculate what was in those texts as anybody would do even from the mainstream. If a great scientist's work like Isaac Newton was thrown into the flames, my God, you're going to tell me that the next guy down the line is not meant to speculate? You know, a Copernicus and a Kepler and a Giordano Bruno. You can't speculate what it might have been in the great man's mind? A Galileo? Of course they do. They do it every day. Our science is built out of it. But suddenly it's taboo when it's, you know, the Apocrypha or some Christian. That's because you pissed on it. That's because you're like a bunch of fucking dogs. Well, I'm telling you, you cannot own knowledge of the world. It's not your property. It's not my property and it's not your property and we're free to speculate. And when you do that, I've just offered my speculations. And I do try to substantiate it because this story of the ley lines is provable. Those obelisks, I don't care if you're in Prague, I don't care if you're in Vienna, I don't care where you are. You can go to Oslo. There's some heavy duty satanic shit going on. Not just in the placement of these objects, but in the m subsequent movement of them, you know, in, in more recent times and all the rest of it. You know, uh, 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 Gothenburg, Stockholm, I'm a living expert on that shit. Uh, I haven't even got the time to go through. You know what? What I found out about those cities, let alone Belfast, and uh, and uh, and we're going to do it. You know, we're going to film that stuff, right? Uh, uh, when it comes to a context like Belfast, but London, Vatican City, you'd be there for the rest of your life, and, there, oh, and you'd see incredible. them up in the balcony laughing at you. It's all conspiracy theory. Oh, is it? Once you've done a bit of the homework, right? Just take the, the image of the green man. Just that one image, folks. You're on your way. Take a camera. Your cell phone will do, since everybody's on that. And you go and study the European you know, permutations of the image of the green man. And you come back and tell me there's no conspiracy. You go to Prague, you go to John D's house. Take a look at the friezes. Take a look at the decor where the man stayed. And then just take his life and go to all the different mansions and houses he stayed in when he was a guest in Europe. And just go and, and study the life of John D. In, in the context of which we're talking symbolically. And then you dare come back and tell me that nothing occult has been going on in this world. Wow, like an incredible synopsis because I was just gonna say, yeah, the Templars, um, there's even evidence with the Hospitallers. I'm gonna be doing some stuff on that and maybe I'll get some of your take on that in the future as well. I'm, I'm trying to do this thing about the Hospitallers because they evolved into the Malta, the Knights of Malta who sit the on Knights the round of table of the you UN. Bet. Yep. And there was this old battle because of what it was that the, the Templars were operating as uh, on the surface, a Protestant group or another group. And then the, the Hospitallers were defending the Vatican and the popes. And they had these battles, but then on another day, they're shaking hands. And then there's the priestly orders that back the warrior orders and like on and on. So, and they believe in this stuff. These Luciferian groups, these black lodges, these Masonic lodges. We've got quotes from the Duke of Brunswick. We've got quotes from some of the highest you know, uh, in the land on that who are saying that they're talking about this. All right. So it's, the information is out there. And I like what you said that for all the people that come from that academic world or even the religious world, look, the people that wrote those books, commissioned those books, own those institutions, own the Smithsonian. Hello, go tell me what the symbol of the Smithsonian is. Let's go talk about that. Um, you know, they, they're into this and they're telling you all this stuff about how you shouldn't be. And I wonder why that is.
because I think there's something more to it, right? And so I guess at this point, Mike, it would be good to go through some of these articles really quick. And then I also have some slides and some other things we've got to show you. i got lots to go through today. Sure. But um, if you had any other comments on it, go ahead. But then uh, you also sent me some other books that we can refer people to so that, again, we're not just talking out of our ass here. You can go do a lifetime of research just on the sources we're going to give to you in this podcast. Start with a book by Lloyd. Go to David Hatcher Childress. Go to eminent people. You don't listen to one word we're saying. Check out the sources, right, and, and prove it for yourself. It's absolutely no good. We don't want to create a dogma out of any of this, right? Exactly. I've always proceeded with the idea I could be wrong. But I also then use the art of saying, but I also could be right. And that gives me the confidence, you see, to move on to write books. I, I wasn't even a good writer or anything like that. I studied hard to perfect my work. <clears throat> and so I've gone on that principle. And, I, and everybody who's listening should do the same thing. You know, I don't need to be right because I've, I've done the work subjectively to convince myself, you know, and I'm not a mathematician, you see, so I'm not a Scott Onstott. I'm not one of these great geometrists, but other people out there are. So what I hope that will happen is that people pick up the thesis and go and try to refute it, you know, um, and that can, that's, that's a journey. And that's a journey I encourage you to go on because it'll take you through the Waddells. It'll take you to the Beaumonts. It'll take you to some of the most fascinating people that have ever lived, like the Shwala de Lubitsches, right? And you can, you know, look, the, some of the greatest astronomers that have ever lived, the, the original ones who went out to Egypt, they came back and they said that temples like the one at Karnak, temples like the one at Luxor, had over the different millennia, the whole structure had been taken down stone by stone and the entire base, which is often one gigantic monumental slab that no crane on the face of the earth can budge, and that was moved one inch and the temple was rebuilt. And these same uh, astronomers discovered that that had happened to a single temple up to four times through the millennia. Wow. Buy That's yourself incredible. a ticket and go to Newgrange and ask yourself a question yeah. that why on December 30, 21st and 22nd and 23rd, this, this thing was built about 5,000 years ago. And that's probably a conservative estimate, right? 3,000 years BC plus. Then why the hell, after the, all of these uh, movements in the heavens, does the sun come in, you know, uh, the famous image of the sun coming in on those three days of the solstice and the moon follows the same night and it still does it to this day. Nobody can explain how the bumblebee can fly and nobody can explain that because there's meant to have been so many movements in the heavens, you know, of the luminaries that that shouldn't even happen on planet earth. And also the earth itself is tilted and, and all of these things. And yet it still happens. What, how do you explain that? For, forget the, forget the solstice point. How did the build the inner chamber? what's called the corbeling of the roof of Newgrange is unexplained folks to this day. And that's just one site. And you it's mind boggling. I've, I've actually been in there. I know you have too, Mike. It's, yeah. it literally changed my life going into that place. It's incredible. They have a, and then that's a really big tomb, right? In Carol Moore, they've got a bunch of little smaller versions of Newgrange, these little cairns they're called, and they all have a little a sun window as well. On the 21st and 22nd and 23rd of December, the sun not only just goes and pokes in one hole, Along the whole hillside, it drops into each one, like something at the fair. The sun just goes through all of those little cairns right into the center of the cairn, the sunlight. All of those cairns were designed by primitive bone chuckers, right? <laughs> wow, that's amazing. You see, there's, and, and that's just the start of it. That's just the start. That's not talking about the princesses of Egypt that are buried in Irish soil. The first king of the first dynasty is buried in Irish soil. The beads and the boats are from Egypt that the, the intellectuals always told you the Egyptians never floated. They got the Nile there and they couldn't build a boat. They're finding them buried in England. They're finding Irish torques. These are sort of a necklace. Up to 500 Irish torques were found in the tomb of Tutankhamun. Who ever told you that last time from the Smithsonian? Yeah, we're on our way, folks. Just pick up a few of the books we're talking about, you know, and head off. Or pick up my Atlantis book and head off. And there's, there's, there's no reason to be drawing conclusions so that you're stuck in concrete. This is not dogmatic. It's far, far more than that. And ultimate, as I've said, it's actually holy work. It's the only kind of holy work there really is. Right. And that's a good point, because when you're looking at this subject, when you're studying this subject, as challenging as it is, because it is going to be challenging. I've had many sleepless nights over this, but it's part of it, right? It's what is you're taking yourself through your own initiation. You're going through, your own, you're going through this underworld journey. 
and you're on a heroic journey. You are automatically on a heroic journey. The minute you're going to say, okay, I hear what you're saying there, mainstream media, mainstream academic, college professor, whatever, guy on a TED talk. I hear what you're saying, but uh, I want to go and corroborate it for myself. Just that alone, regardless of what your conclusions will be, right or wrong, that alone is you're, you're beginning the heroic journey. You're separating yourself from 99.9997% of human beings walking on this planet that are willing to literally just sit there and go, feed me knowledge. I do not want to think for myself because that's painful. It means I have to separate from the group. It means I have to go on my own journey. I don't have those safety training wheels on my bike and I might fall and I might get made fun of and I might be wrong sometimes and I might, you know, and nobody wants to do that, but that's what it takes to build genius, right? So that's a really good point I want to say is that these subjects, as fascinating as they are, I love these subjects, right? But I love them and I'm sure you do too, Michael, because you've made it a part of you. You've made it a part of your journey and um, it's, it's a process of doing, as we look at the external world, the size and scale of the universe and what the hell's going on underground, you're also learning about the size and scale of your consciousness and what's going on in your own internal underground at the same time, right? Yeah. Yeah. And never forget what I said earlier. It is now a fact, statistical fact, that the smartest people in the world are joining the alternative paradigms, folks. So any, I understand why there's a bit of a trepidation and hesitation, but you're, you, you don't miss the bus for goodness sake, because some of the smartest people, way smarter than anyone who taught you in the front of those classes, are already well into all things I could list here for hours and hours and hours of the, of the what do you call them, the, you know, the alternative paradigms. They're no longer slushy. They're no longer tinfoil hat stuff at all, right? Uh, and I'm not just talking about people in the media or clever people. I'm talking about the most eminent thinkers in our world today, right, are, are, are catching the drift. And they are part of the deconstruction of all the lies we've been talking about, right? And yet, and yet really, they're inferior to the class of the original alternative guys who are way ahead of them. But, of course, those guys didn't prosper and those guys didn't get the attention, right? But, but nevertheless, it's a fact now that these subjects of paranormal subject matter, uh, you know, all of this has been picked up from A to Z by some of the smartest people in the world, you know, and I know their names and, and I'm always going to feature them in my work. Well, you've sent a few of them to me. I'm going to show people some of the books, first of all, that you sent. Uh, this is a book I haven't heard of. I'm going to pick it up after this show. It's called Underground by Will Hunt. This is fascinating. That's right. And then very good book to start with, because, again, I not only recommend books, but I want those that are so comprehensive that person doesn't have to spend their whole fucking life. You know, mm -hmm. so if they can read it in one or two books, I'm happy with that. You know, so Hatcher Childress, great works. You know, Edda Dorf is a great fiction thing. You'll really enjoy that book very much. You know, movies like, say, uh, you know, that film uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Right. That might have been based, you see, on Edda Dorfa. Edda Dorfa was a bestseller at the time. You can't imagine how popular that work was. Same with like the works of Ignatius Donnelly. You know, where are we now, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, one Hopi. Book of the Hopi is very important because it substantiates Zuni and Hopi myths about the underground world. So, you know, very, very good book and not available on Kindle, but I would, I would order this anyway by Waters because uh, he doesn't go on at length about it, but he definitely talks about the Zuni is one of the most important races of Native American Indians, along with the Hopi, you know, and others as well, like the Navajo, to talk about the people who lived in the earth, you know, uh, sort of your Coco Pelli type, you know. Uh, they call them the ant people. So this is an important tie-in. You kind of alluded to it earlier when you talked about the terrestrial version and then the, the extraterrestrial version. There is, there's the story of the indigenous people, you know, that represented by Coco Pelli, represented by, you know, the little people or whoever, or the ant people as they've been called. Did they, right, is this a sort of a progenitor race that they're responsible for these tunnels? See, look, there's about 15 to 20 books right now on Gobleki Tipi alone, right, from all sorts of scholars who've written dozens of books on that kind of subject, you know, rushing off to the latest one, latest dig or latest find. The evidence is before their eyes of, you know, say the presence of the little people, my video, the daemons, people can watch on Unslaved. Not one of those eminent people, and these are people who have access to the top scholars and the archaeologists who dug up the original stuff. In none of their books at all is any mention of the little people, and yet they have the evidence right in front of their eyes that says those tunnels, especially at Gulbleke Tipi, I'm just using one example, but anybody who studied Ireland knows this for sure. 
Look, what am I talking about? Even the so-called air shafts in the pyramid. Anybody notice something weird about that? First of all, they're not air shafts. But they're tiny little tunnels. And there's hundreds of them at Goblacky Teepee that have been discovered. And all these eminent scholars who've written bestsellers for Random House are going, yo, we still don't have any answers. All over the world is the evidence of a progenitor race, you know, that was small and could run up and down these tunnels and that's how they would dug out. And my, bring in Michael Cremo and his discoveries, you know, of, of Brazil and all these you know, incredible tunnels that are down there. It's just like, that's obvious to me. The whole of uh, under Paris is catacombed with these tiny little tunnels. Even a, even a five foot man, a four foot, you know, girl cannot go down those tunnels with any ease. Right, so what does that tell us then? So look, we're, you know, the person listening to us, you can go ahead in no time. The experts haven't a fucking clue. And just because they got really important spinner rack books, you know, and all this, there's still room. I could, I, I don't do it because I don't want to reference some of these people because I, I dislike them as people. But, you know, there are people who've written some of the best selling books on all of these different sites throughout the world. And, uh, and some of their work is really good in other respects, but they're still missing links. So there's another case that I brought it in the Atlantis book about an indigenous people, you know, that were basically enslaved. Then you can say, no, wait a minute, I'm not buying into that. I like this idea about that the earth was colonized by sophisticated Vulcan-like beings, right, who are, were immoral and warlike and cold. They didn't have any emotions. And they're the ones who then built the sites. And then the halfway point is, okay, there was the original and then the other Nephilim built on top of those original sites. I'm open to all three because I think it is a combination of all three. Because you know what a dolmen is, right? Right. Uh, it's those standing stones that you find all over the West, especially now, and they have that big slab which can't even be lifted by hundreds of men, right? Tons and tons, like 70 fucking tons or some shit. Some of these are, right? Even academics have accepted that those were burial sites because they weren't, they were covered in a mound. Every dolmen that you know had an earthened, you know, mound around it, like a little mound, right? And the farmers, because they wanted the stones, the big stones, used to take away the mud and, and the, of the, you know, they desecrate the place and pull out the big stones that they could use on their walls and stuff like that, right? So there's only a few dolmens left of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that used to be everywhere. Each one of those is a grave. But nobody over five feet can be buried under one of them. Just saying, right? As I said, we've done our, yeah, the little people, you know, premium members have watched it, but, you know, People listening to us now can head over to Unslaved and check that out. And how come it is then that 15 of the most eminent, highly funded, and uh, big, the big egos, you know, the big heads, that, that have actually physically gone to all these places? Not a word. You see, so don't think for one minute that these subjects are closed like you've already alluded to. It is endless, it is endless, it is endless. It really is. And there's been so many people that have done this work and it's even gotten into mainstream. You know, I myself have been on shows like Ancient Aliens and things where, you know, there's a lot of hogwash on there too, but they do put in some good people on there. They do put some good stuff in there. Ralph Ellis has been on there, Hatcher Childress and all these people, you know, Von Daniken came out so long ago with his, his idea and then people built on it. Even the mistakes that he made, you know, people have shown, you know, there is something going on here, at least worth speculating about. And then you even have these articles. Um, which one is this? I'll go through some of the articles that you had sent me. Um, this one might look a little blacked out. It's talking about a complicated tunnel system that has been found stretching almost a quarter mile from Mexico into the United States by Homeland Security investigations. Authorities said the tunnel was intended for smuggling and ran from a neighborhood in Mexico to a subterranean neighborhood of San Luis, Arizona. The tunnel was discovered before there was access created on the U.S. side. You know, so this is something that, you know, kind of, it might feel like it's off topic, but it actually connects in because we've had all this discussion about the smuggling of drugs, weapons, and people, you know, human trafficking, um, how they do it, how they're trying to get across the border and all these kinds of things. Um, but you got to remember that this is very sophisticated and it networks around the world. I mean, they've, they've discovered stuff. Last time I was in Los Angeles, I was sitting in the Uber and the Uber driver is sitting there the whole time we're driving. I had like an hour drive to where I was going. And the whole time he's sitting there telling me all about the underground tunnels in Los Angeles and the underground networks that are there and all that kind of crazy. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Um, I had a friend of mine who lives uh, here and he, he's not really interested in all this big stuff, but he told me, he's like, yeah, man, even in Victoria and places like that, there's entire underground networks there's all these satanic groups that have been using these underground systems for a long time. You know, there's been investigations and then they kind of go quiet. 
and you hear these things, and I'm sure people listening now can tell me stories of in their area, oh, I heard there's these underground caves here, or under, I heard there's underground tunnels under my city, you know, Ottawa, the capital of Canada, underground tunnel systems. I've, I've known security uh, that work in those parliament buildings that have said, yeah, there's sort of the public access that are these politicians going, and then there's other underground systems that go even deeper all the way through mm-hmm. the city. Montreal, Paris, you know, on and on we can go, right? Um, there was another one here. This is, oh yeah, so this is getting into the secret tunnel found in Mexico. Another article that you sent. We'll include all these links, but you know, this is just a the Smithsonian coming out and saying, oh, I think we finally solved these mysteries of the Tiwanakan, and this is the chance discovery beneath a nearly 2,000-year-old pyramid that leads to the heart of a lost civilization. You know, so it's even getting the mainstream attention now. Um, we have this other story here, kind of thinking about LA. This is, you know, Los Angeles Magazine. I can't remember when, this is 2014, where they're talking about underground catacombs of LA's lizard people. And it says Elon Musk didn't invent the idea of drilling holes into Los Angeles. <laughs> George Warren Schufelt did it first. And there's all these shafts right. and there's this myths, these myths and legends about these, you know, reptilian beings or lizard people that are underneath these caverns. Um, there's been documentaries. Yep. You can look at this one called Hellier. You can m- watch the seasons on online of this group that this paranormal investigation group that goes all over the place trying to find these underground caverns and they run into all kinds of crazy stuff. So it's out there. I mean, it's, it's, it's now it's at the point where it's even hitting the mainstream. That's right. Schufeld's work. Uh, I, I mentioned in the Atlantis book and DVD as well. And other ones who even find networks in the Grand Canyon that were known to the Indians, but they never spoke about it. You see, and as I said, the Zuni and Hopi are more specific. They talk about an actual race of beings who either lived under there or who were forced under there, you know, because of a cataclysm and you know, it's hard to work out exactly what that is, but uh, you know, there is who would even come up with stories like that in 1970 at a, a popular town outside of Belfast called Bangor, right? A bit of a touristy place in the summer, right? But they have a university there and it's on a, a fairly large hill, which was run by the Ward family, right? Amer- Americans will know about Montgomery Ward. Well, that's an Illuminati family, by the way. And they, they, they come from two back to back provinces in Northern Ireland. The Montgomery's own one area and the, and the wards of the other, right? The Ward family are Illuminati and this uh, college and some other structures, you know, are on this h- a hill owned by them. There used to be a car park at the base, uh, you know, right in the center of Bangor. What do you know? A sinkhole appeared uh, in, the, in the car park. Or it might have been that workers were, you know, trying to enlarge the car park or whatever. They found a network of tunnels so sophisticated under the town of Bangor. Now, this is an island, it might be a primitive place, you know, 100 years before, 50 years before. What's this extremely unusual and tiny little bricks, you know, all the way down to the sea? This is a seaside resort. And so they put it down to the Templars again, you know, or the hospitalers, right not far, or many hospitaler ruins, by the way. So you're right to get into the hospitalers. Uh, there's a certain part of that area that's got several hospital or, you know, old, old priories. The point I'm trying to make is, why did they then cover that up? Because you can't find, after after they fixed the car park, the story of that underground thing was scrubbed from all media outlets. Now, why? So there is an immediate proof of conspiracy. Because if it meant nothing, and it was just some old smuggler's thing, right? It would, it would be in the record. It wouldn't have been airbrushed. You cannot find anecdotes of that, you know, or, or stories about that item anywhere. And, and, and it goes, and that is the same story when you want to look into a lot of things that we're talking about. When I said salt lines, S-A-L-T, right? The Cistercians. They, the Cistercians didn't invent that. The Cistercians just discovered it. So back in the 10th century, 11th century, 12th, the Knights Templar are remodeling and they're, you know, working at reconstituting a, a, a network of ley lines that already existed there from Druidic times. If those people can accept it and even work on it and then position their own priories, monasteries, uh, uh, nunneries, and stately homes right on the vertices of these places, this has all been confirmed, then I want to know why it was so important to them to do that. They're meant to be Christians. So this pagan stuff, just like looking at the stars in astronomy, it's meant to be all taboo, right? These are meant to be the warriors of Christ. Do we see a little iffy something or other there? Yeah. 
and as I said, go to go to go to the headquarters of the great churches. Go to Rome, right? Go to all of these uh, uh, places that are considered. Um, go to Washington D.C. Twenty-two zodiacs oh, yeah. secreted into the ar architecture. The house of the temple and all. The, are, weren't they Christians? Well, why is the number thirteen then so important to them, right? As you start to look at this whole thing, you realize what lies behind that Christian facade, and and you're on your way. Yeah, very important. And um, just want to bring up, I'll just go through a couple of these slides. This was an article that you sent me as well. I found it also. It's from History, where they're just talking about you know seven or eight of of the known mysterious underground caverns that are known to be ancient or a little bit more modern. Right. So we'll start here. Uh, with this Darren Kuyu in Turkey. So Darren Kuyu, for those that don't know, is an underground city. It's an ancient multi-level underground city in the Darren Kuyu district of Nesvir province, Turkey. It's an 18-story interior that was self it was a self-contained metropolis that included ventilation shafts, wells, kitchens, school rooms, oil presses, a bathhouse, a winery, and a living space for some 20,000 people. When threatened by attack, each level of the city would be sealed off behind a collection of monolithic stone doors, of which are so monumentally huge, it boggles the mind. Uh, historians believe that the Hittites, speaking of the Hittites, or the Phygians were among Darren Kuyu's earliest builders, but it was later occupied and expanded by a host of other groups, including Byzantine era Christians, who left behind a collection of underground frescoes and chapels. Despite its long history, the city wasn't rediscovered until the 1960s when a local man stumbled upon some of its tunnels while renovating his home. What an amazing thing, eh? And then yeah. moving on, we have uh, Navours, or Navou, located in northern France. The underground city of uh, Navours includes two miles of tunnels and more than 300 man-made rooms, all of them hidden, some 100 feet beneath a forested plateau. The site began its life around the 3rd century AD as a part of a Roman quarry, but it was later expanded into a subterranean village after locals began using it as a hiding place during the wars and invasions of the Middle Ages. At its peak, it had enough room for 3,000 inhabitants and included its own chapels, stables, wells, and bakeries. And if you notice, in just the two, the first two I've brought up here, and there's a few more, um, they're already talking about how somebody, they don't know for sure, they have a guess, they think it was certain groups, who originally constructed these places, and then it was later inhabited by follow, you know, other different groups and tribes and civilizations who used it later on, right? So just remember that when people go, oh, that was just for, uh, you know, it was just used as subterranean villages during the Middle Ages. Go, oh no, no, they used it, but they didn't build it, right? And then the next one um, is the Wilitska salt mine. I'm probably butchering that. Look at the artwork on that. Right? But this is also known as the Underground Salt Cathedral. It's Poland's salt mine and is a massive subterranean complex of rooms, passageways, and statues located on the outskirts of Krakow. The site dates to the 1200s when miners first descended beneath the Earth's surface to find rock salt. In the centuries that followed, they slowly carved the mine into a warren of galleries and tunnels that extended more than a thousand feet underground. And then we have the churches at Lalibela. I actually did a whole uh, feature episode with the show Unexplained with William Shatner on this site. You can go check that out. I think it's on Amazon Prime still. A really fascinating place, but just a quick synopsis. They think that in the 12th century AD, a devout king ordered the construction of 11 Christian churches in Ethiopian village of Lalibela. This quote-unquote New Jerusalem is notable for having been fashioned from the top down. All of its churches were hewn from volcanic rock below the earth's surface then hollowed out, giving them the appearance of having grown directly out of the ground. And just so people know, this is not the way they build churches. Usually they, they build them from, you know, the surface of the, of the earth and they build it ground up, right? This was actually dug out of the, of the ground. Um, the most iconic building is the cross-shaped church of St. George, interesting, which was cut from a monolithic slice of stone inside a trench 100 feet deep. It was then connected to the rest of the complex via a network of underground passageways, hidden caves, and catacombs. Legend has it that the construction of Lalibela took just 24 years, but many historians believe it was actually completed in phases over several centuries. And I just want to quickly say that when I was looking at the artwork that was sent to me by the producers, actually, of the Unexplained episode, I was looking through the artwork and I found 
uh, double-headed eagles, stars of David, and some other interesting Templar-related symbolism, which uh, there's actually an official theory that this was Templar-constructed. It wasn't some king who had some dream of an angel. It was Templar-constructed for the purpose of housing. Uh, some people think it was the Ark of the Covenant, but I just think they may have just been housing some, you know, some treasure or who knows what. And uh, this was built by them for whatever reason as this sort of underground fortress. But it boggles the mind how they even did this and the knowledge that it would have taken to do it. And then we well, go to this uh, fascinating place called Petra. It's formed or it's famed for its uh, cameo in the film Indiana Jones, The Last Crusade. Petra is an ancient caravan city tucked away in the mountains of southern Jordan. I mean, go tell your friends, hey guys, what are you doing this weekend? Let's go carve a city out of a mountain. Sounds good. Let's do it. Uh, the site has been inhabited since prehistory, but it reached its peak some 2,000 years ago when the ancient Nabataeans hand-chiseled the surrounding sandstone hillside into a dazzling collection of tombs, banquet halls, and temples, one of the most exquisite edifices in al Kazneh -Kiz or the treasury, which includes an ornamental facade that extends 130 feet up a rock face. And Petra may have been home to 20,000 people at its height. Excavations at the site are still ongoing today, and it's believed that the vast majority of its ruins may still lurk underground. So there's still, after all this time, there's still mystery upon mystery in these types of places. And then I just have uh, two more here. This one's interesting as well, a little bit more modern. Uh, or Vieto. Beginning with the ancient, ancient Etruscans, generations of, oh, this is in Italy. Ancient Etruscans, generations of locals burrowed their way deep into the volcanic rock bluff on which the city was originally built. The subterranean maze was first carved to wells and cisterns, but over the centuries it grew to include more than 12,000 interlocking tunnels, grottos, and galleries. Some chambers include the remnants of Etruscan-era sanctuaries and medieval olive presses, while others show signs of having been used as storage places for wine, for roots of roots for pigeons, um, and etc. So the underground city was also frequently employed as a hiding place during the times of strife, as recently as World War II, where people still used certain sections as bomb shelters. And then the last one here, this is some more of the World War or the Cold War era, uh, Burlington Bunker. So basically in the event of a Cold War era nuclear strike, the most important members of the British government would have retreated to a 35 acre, 35 acre underground complex located 100 feet beneath the villages of Karsham. This Burlington bunker, as it was codenamed, was first built in the 50s from a series of existing tunnels and stone quarries. It contained office spaces, cafeterias, a telephone exchange, medical facilities, and sleeping quarters, all of it designed to keep the British Prime Minister and some 4,000 other key government personnel alive during an emergency. There was even an in-house BBC studio that the Prime Minister could use to address the public. While never put into active use, the Burlington facility remained partially operational until 2004 when it was fully decommissioned and declassified. So just a few of many examples. Um, we could go to India with the, uh, the, I'm trying to remember the name of that structure, um, where they basically, again, carved an entire city out of a mountain. Uh Elora Caves. Elora Caves, right? And there's yeah, another there's cave others. system that's there. Uh, Blavatsky writes about it. She writes about seances and stuff that were going on in those caves mm. to speak to other dimensional or off-world beings. This is, the literature is there for all these places. It's just amazing. Yeah. And uh, they, they've buried so much on the identity of the Etruscans. They will admit that the Etruscans, along with it, see, the schoolboy is taught that, you know, the Greeks... The Greek pantheon and everything was adopted by Rome, but before that, they had a few gods that you know were just normal Indo-European staples, you know, like the thunder god and and the goddess of the earth and all of that. But what they refuse to tell you is the influence of these people they call the Etruscans, and we don't even know if that was a name that they used for themselves. They seem to have come out of a group of it was called Lydian, L Y D Lydian, right? And they seem to have come out. Uh, there's evidence that some of the most eminent historians have discovered that there's a Norse connection, a Nordic connection, just like, you know, the Box saga when we did that. We speculated that after the fall of the Box, you know, the Finnish and Norse, the Teutonic, if you want to use those general terms, you know, influenced uh, because they moved. They had to move from the north down into other climes. 
So all of this has been hidden. The, the story of the Phrygians is very, very, very important, right? So later on, when they talk about this and that group in BC, using those tunnels, as you said, that's much later. Just like in the same way, the story of the Christians and their catacombs and their labyrinths, those things were pagan. In fact, half the shit on the wall of them, of the little boy standing on a fish that they adopted, the Jesus freaks, right? They borrowed that. That's Dionysus. You, before it was scratched out, it used to say Iacos, with the I being a J, Jacos, right? It's uh, nothing more than Bacchus, right? Uh, those under, there's not a Christian who carved any of those catacombs. And yet, you know, Christians who grew up on MGM and all, or just reading a lot of Christian books, assume that those catacombs were, oh, that was our, we, we went into the catacombs. Yeah. Who built them? What? What was, what was that? Right? And yeah, they may have so gone in later. Even, Right, they may have gone in they later, go but, later, but again, who They're originally hundreds built of it? Years before, holy shit, the Orphics built it, right? And you wouldn't believe the orgiastics. The Christians don't even know. They're done in like you know, they're in the the, the equivalent of a fucking whorehouse down there. They're, you know, they don't even know the waving the cross. They don't know what the hell was going on down there with these Gnostics and Orphics, you know, with all of their uh, potions and sexual rites. You see. So right in the middle of the, see, the Christian needs to clean up his own house is what keeps saying. They don't need to be worrying what we're doing, right? They need to worry about all the pagan elements, including the astrotheology, the goddess cult, the ethnogens, you know, like on our last program. They have got so much stuff to clean up that's, that's already incongruous within their own canon. The Gnostic elements alone, you see? And so they should not be trying to critique anything anybody that anybody else is doing their own origins, St. Peter's Square, right? That whole place. And many of the temples that were right on the centers of Mithra, right? Temples of Aphrodite, temples of Mithras, temples of Venus. You know, uh, they found evidence that uh, Rome start 700 BC about that. The very, very first mythos, right? That is associated with the growth of the city of Rome. This famous city that you know transformed the world technologically. Half the models we still have today you know, specialization in colleges and science. This all starts in Rome. There was nothing before that. So this tribe, the Latini, right? Their very first mythology by which they inframe, you know, Romulus and Remus, people know about it, right? The wolf cub and all that stuff. This original mythos wasn't in, uh, was not indigenous to the Latini or the Romans. It was Nordic. It's a copy of, you know, it's a, it's a replaying of the uh, uh, myth of Odin and Thor. And, and the war between the gods. So it didn't happen. But Rome found it so important, right, to use that mythos for their culture and civilization. Doesn't that mean that they must have been kindred? You don't borrow somebody's mythology just and say, this is going to be the central and most primal mythology of our culture. Right? That's what I said about it's okay to speculate because the obvious speculation is they are the north. They picked the central mythology of Odin, right, uh, because they are of that branch. Is that some wacko jacko theory? Just in the same way that every single element of Christianity is taken from the stellar cult. What do people know about the stellar cult? What the hell do they know about the solar cult? What did those people actually believe? Right? So in my work, you know, with the article, Heaven to Earth, all of these things, you know, signs in the sky, whatever it is, we've got to get into the mentality, right? So who would dig these underground? Who See, for instance, the Templars, right? When the Templars got to the Holy Land, they weren't expert builders at all. They were actually hopeless. What happened was they bun they ran into a group that most people have never heard of, right? They've, you know, well, actually, they bumped into several groups: the Silesian pirates, go figure, the uh, what's called the uh, Italian merchants, and that's a polite term for them, uh, like a sort of a, a branch of the early Black nobility, a, a, an immensely important group that the Templars learned from. They met the assassins. That one's more popularly known, even though it's not, uh, you know, it's it's more enlarged than that, right? And they met a group that very few people know about called the Dionysian Artificers. And the Dionysian Artificers were the super masons who built that structure. You know, the one you were talking about was built from down up. And those Dionysian Artificers are another cult, just like the Stellar Cult, whose people were commissioned. It's like trying to get a producer, you know, for your rock band. Yeah, I'll get to you next year. Right? They're busy. Well, these Dionysian and artificers were the ones that were called in. That's who the Phoenicians were. The Phoenicians had their Dionysian artificers. And these were the men who knew geometry. 
just like somebody who specializes in herbs or medicinal herbs or in crystallography, right? So the Templars were instructed by the Italian merchants who showed, the, showed them how to build. Because when the Templars got to the Holy Land, the structures that they were given by the Italian merchants to move into, they didn't build themselves. They were allowed to have these mansions, right? Christian groups in the West, Christian, Christian groups in the Middle East gave the king of Jerusalem, who was a Templar, right, Baldwin or whatever, loads and loads of land. But they gave them the land and the buildings that were crumbling because they didn't want them, right? Hoping that the Templars would you know, live in them, fix them up, just like, you know, a damp house. If somebody turns on the heaters, you know, the property goes up in price. Well, that's what happened to the Templars. So the Templars then called in local masons from Italy, right, to help them rebuild these structures which have been donated to them all over the world, all over the uh, area of Europe. And that's how they became expert builders. And while they were out there, they made contact not just with these Muslim groups, you know, like the assassins and these secret societies and all that. They made, you, uh, they made contact with an immensely ancient group. And so these anomalies, even if they happen to be found in, in France, southern France at René-le-Chateau, Look up, you know, look up that word, the Dionysian artificers. And there's not a later group, I don't care if they're Christian or whoever the hell they think they are, including the Knights Templar, who didn't learn from these people how to set the ley lines in place, you know, put the objects, what stone to use, how to carve it. And that's been scrubbed from history. That super secret Masonic group, right? And I believe that the, their descendants even have a hand, you see, in, you know, the building of places like Washington, D.C., but, the, but they may have also been people who built some of these underground temples as well, uh, right. although I, I think it might have even been earlier. But the Dionysian artificers would have been people who would have gone below, learned how that was done, and many of the structures date to them, and even from an earlier group, you know, these Phrygians and others that you mentioned. Right. Oh, yeah, it's, that's an incredible story to open up. And, I mean, when you think about it, you can also bring in catastrophism as one of the reasons why ancient, ancient peoples we're digging into the earth. One theory is that a lot of them were trying to escape, uh, you know, the, the turmoil that was going on on the surface. Um, then later on, the historians are like, oh, they were just trying to hide from invading armies. That's quite a lot of work to tunnel out in this rock, for, like, I don't know how many, 400 feet deep, 1,000 feet deep more, you know, 20,000 people can live in there uh, just to hide out from some, some bandits. Why not put all your energy into building a more powerful defense system? It just, you know, it, yeah, maybe later on, but again, the original concept of uh, tunneling into the earth, perhaps they were also learning from beings that they might have been interacting with that may have been fleeing even earlier cataclysms, or that may even, as we've said, this idea of fallen angels or something may have escaped into the well, earth strategically. Yeah, and in the Atlantis book, that's the route I take, is that these caves were already made. And when the Nephilim were hiding out from their pursuers and then later groups when they wanted that, everyone knew about these. See, all of the different uh, similar places, these deep, deep caves in Ireland, were always associated with the fairy race, right? Mm. Uh, so much so that, well, take the Marble Caves. There's a place in Inniskillen called the Marble Caves. Nobody fucking went near that, right? All the local people in Tyrone, all around that area stayed away from that place for hundreds of years until even in, in my time and you know in modern times there's still the rumor there's still the idea that that's sacred that's holy that's that's another race and we don't trespass on their well because they put a curse on us right we just don't go there we don't interfere with them i mean that's what i mean about folklore all you got to do is take it seriously and there's all the reasons in the world because that's where the secret history of the world is Archived is in those folk tales. Well, I couldn't be sure when they talk about Cool Holland walking into the waves and the waves boil because of his body heat. Yeah, I believe it. How about that? It's actually a well known catalog thing that mystics and gurus in the East do that. That was what called a, you know, it would be chi, wouldn't it? It would be, you know, an ex extremely advanced chi, just like a high, a very, very ultimately strengthened immune system. Well, these guys have, I can't remember the actual term that they use for this. It's, it's, it's escaping me right now, but it actually is existing, right? This idea. So it's only the narrow mind, you see. But I don't talk to the narrow mind, right? That's why I, have, I don't talk to the world. I'm not interested in what they think about. I'm interested in what the great mavericks have to say and, and you know, preserving their work in their books. And if need be, reiterating it in my work. Yeah, and I mean, we've got to remember that we've been cut off and and 
changed so much over time. I mean, we're not the same human beings on so many levels, you know, we're, we're, especially once we had all these big cities and we had all these radio frequencies coming in and satellites and technology. Um, there's pros to that, but there was cons, which cut us off to, with the actual energetic uh, connection, the energetic frequencies of the earth, the Schumann resonance, the, you know, you got these organizations like the Heart Math Institute trying to talk about the bioenergetics of the body and, um, you know, the idea of uh, even psychic phenomenon and all these different things that the, even the CIA spent millions and millions of dollars studying in all these different programs and other intelligence agencies. So there's something that we've been, if you really look at it, there's an interesting case to be made that we're treated like pets and we're treated like farm animals by the people that really know what's going on. And that, you know, if they need to change us from mock, if you go back to the idea of the genetic manipulation, they had all these different mock versions of humanity that eventually got the desirable one that was just smart enough to understand how to work all the tools and do all the work and listen to some commands. And that was still dumb enough to not figure out what was really going on. And that's been a process. Look what's happening with the drugging with the chemicals in the water supply, with the food industry, with the air quality, with the, with the type of uh, fear propaganda. Look at the world we're living in right now where they're spraying all the carts at Costco and hyper-sanitizing the world so that the, your immune system is going to get completely destroyed because you don't have access to all the bacteria that you need in order to keep an immune system alive. But that being said, we've kind of talked about a lot of these different themes. I wanted to set that stage first because... Everything we've kind of been talking about was uh, spoken about in a different way by a gentleman named Phil Schneider back in the early and mid 90s. Um, and people can, everybody's had their speculation about him, but he was an interesting character for me because uh, number one, he only did about six presentations and then he was shortly killed. He was thereafter killed. Uh, he was actually murdered brutally. Um, and he just, he, he had some very interesting things to say on these lines. Um, so I got a little clip here. It's about four minutes. You can go look into it. You can make of it what you want. But based on what we've been talking about, I don't know. Tell me what you think. Uh, I spent 17 years in black budget programs. Um, government geologist, as engineer, structural engineer with aerospace applications. Military is known about the alien question for the better part of 70 years, and they first saw their glimpse of what was going on as early as 1909 in the American Southwest. Now, Army cavalry evidently were chasing some bandits, and they entered this cave. They were holed up in a cave, and what they found in there was flying discs and, and little gray guys and all kinds of weird things, and they didn't know how to explain that, and they wrote them down as best they could, and it's been in secret archives ever since. That's up in the, this in the, down by the Truth or Consequences uh, area of New Mexico. Well, the alien thing is more than just a, what I'd call a non-visible threat. We on the surface, first of all, all information dealing with alien or alien reproduced technology or alien reproduced vehicles or any other kinds of things, well hidden from the American public. Our black budget, for instance, garners $1.023 trillion every two years. It's over $500 billion a year. Right now, there are 131 active deep underground military bases in the United States. There's 1,477 of them worldwide. Each one has an average cost of 17 to 19 billion dollars. Each one is uh, built in the site. Uh, oh, it used to be it'd take a year to two years to build each one, and now they're capable of building a couple of them a year uh, with sophisticated methods. So, uh, up here we have a transparency of Groom Lake. Groom Lake is where the infamous Area 51, S4, S2, a CIA base, the uh, uh, it was originally a bombing range, a nuclear test site. Uh, it was later become the most secret base in the United States. Um, it employs over 18,000 workers who work in shifts of 12 hours a, at a whack. Most of them work in the cover of darkness, like us. We built out uh, nine underground military bases there, each with an average uh, 
uh, capacity, capable of uh, basically a city underground, roughly four and a quarter cubic miles hollowed out underground. They have boring machines, for instance. Now, boring machines, for instance, they don't bore. They literally vitrify and melt the rock, deflagrate the rock. It's a very sophisticated laser uh, uh, melting and deflagrating system. It reduces the rock to a powder and then melts the the remaining rock is a coating on the inside of the base, so you don't have to use gunite cements and other kinds of things like that. That's all the all old hat now. Uh, technology is just basically the new technology we get is the old hat of the military. I'm going to be real brief about it. I carried a level one security clearance, the Rylite 38 Factor. There are very few of us. There's nobody except myself, to my knowledge, talking like this. <clears throat> nobody. I'm breaking the law. I'm breaking world as well as federal law, coming out and even talking about this to a group of people. The public basically has been totally lied to. We're considered stupid or even moronic in some cases. Uh, it's got to stop. If, if we're going to gain our country back, we must, and I repeat, must, regain, we must instill in our public officials Anybody that goes and does public service, they must tell us the truth. If they cannot do this, then, then they must be impeached or they must, must be removed from office. If this cannot occur, if, if the truth cannot totally come out, the, the, I, there are reasons for secrecy, for instance, but if the truth cannot totally come out, uh, what's the use in us having anything called freedom? So, you know, there's this is a two hour presentation that he does. He uh, used to go around showing people different metals and things that you couldn't break, you couldn't touch. Um, uh, you know, I, I've interviewed Richard Dolan about him. He, he did the forward for a, a documentary that was made about the life of Phil Schneider and how he got killed and the whole thing. Um, it's just interesting. It's interesting when you plug these things in. If you just sit down and watch something like that, you go, what are you talking about aliens underground and all this weird shit? But if you understand the background of where we're coming from, does it really f seem as far fetched? That someone would come out, talk about that. And there's been many people, and many of them could be, you know, spreading disinformation. You always have to keep that critical mind. But, um, you know, just think about this as a possibility. And then I have, I've interviewed this gentleman. I, you can't reach him anymore today. But one of his books, he's got a series of books on the underground structures. Phil, or sorry, uh, Richard Souter. He's a PhD. Uh, this is a book that I've been reading. I was reading over my holidays. And in this book, he's got loads of declassified documentation about Operation Paperclip, uh, the names of the certain Nazi scientists that were actually already engaged with technologies like the Nazi bell, where they were trying to tap into the quantum stuff. Uh, they were engaged in building these underground facilities and the technology that's used that it's funny that Phil Schneider's mentioning with this idea of not just like pushing rock, but actually vitrifying it through laser technology. They're massive, these things. Um, this goes really, really, really deep. And there's just pages and pages of documentation by Souter and many others who talk about this. And so um, real quickly, I had a couple notes on the, so we talked about the ancient sites. We've talked about the, the myths and everything else. And, um, and then I also have, well, let me get my notes here. Just a couple notes about the actual military facilities and just how many. I mean, Phil Schneider mentioned, what, 170-something and then 1,400 or so worldwide. Um, you know, we have known base locations in Cheyenne Mountain, Camp David, Maryland, the subterranean labyrinth, beneath the N uh, which is beneath the NSA base in Fort Meade, Maryland. Um, and there's a quote here from author James Bamford, who wrote a book called The Puzzle Palace, which I recommend everybody check out, where he says the NSA's enormous basement, which stretches for city blocks beneath the headquarter building, undoubtedly holds the largest and most advanced computer operation in the world. Uh, then we have places like Raven Rock, which is underneath the Pentagon, Mount Weather, which is a FEMA, a FEMA uh, construction, it's a 400 acre complex. There's a known underground facility underneath the White House. Uh, there's more. There's facilities that are known in Texas, Nebraska, New Mexico, Nevada, Colorado, Tennessee, California, on and on. We go. I could tell you about Canada. I know even on on Vancouver Island, there's an actual restricted access military facility here that nobody gets to go into. Uh, some people think there's some interesting stuff going on there regarding even the trafficking question. 
um, you know, on and on we could go. So you've got ancient stories going all the way back to Atlantis and before of these of digging into the earth. You've got modern governments and militaries and intelligence agencies and even corporations. There's private corporations that do this also. And they use tons of money to do this. And people will go, well, how, how's the government and the Pentagon funding this stuff? And you just got to go, well, you remember that story after 9-11 with Donald Rumsfeld coming out? Couldn't find trillions of dollars. What is it, 17 trillion dollars? It just went missing. Some people did something with it and we don't know really what it is. It's like, oh, when was the last time you dropped 17 trillion dollars out of your pocket? You couldn't find it, right? So then you go, okay, so we know they're siphoning money out of the tax system to build these classified underground and also possibly these secret space programs, etc. cetera, um, trying to get out of the Van Allen belt and stuff. Um, and then you have the other ways that they can fund their operations. We know the CIA, MI6, etc. use their pirates. That's what they do. The old Silesian pirates are talking about. This is the modern version of it where they actually use weapons, drug trade, and human trafficking trade as a way of financing their special operations. So there's been stuff going on underground that I think would blow people's minds. And, you know, it's, it's just endless the moment you get into it. That's right. Uh, they have a in Whit Whitby Island, you know, off the coast, Pacific coast, well known as a place for child uh, abduction and all of that, uh, China Lake as well, don't forget. But the thing is that there's also a whole network of tunnels under the sea as well. Right. Uh, yeah. And I highly, you know, oh, yeah, they go on for thousands of miles. So uh, some are man made and some are not. So Richard Souter is brilliant. I've had his two books, you know, since the early 90s. I've basically promoted those on every blog that I used to have. Wonderful work, wonderful work. Uh, it was stuff that we're bringing out now that, you know, has been in the shelf for a long, long time that I wanted to, to get to. And I do mention him in the Atlantis book as well, because that can be a very new concept to people, you know, that, that there are such structures, you know. But again, on the metaphysical level, why are people buried in the ground? Where did that come from, right? That's not common with a, a, all the nations of the world. So it's a ritualistic thing. What, where did that come from exactly? Right, just phenomenologically, where did the idea of burying your dead in the earth come from? Right, and why? So there's a why question, just like there's obviously a why question when you see a temple that's been carved out of rock from the top to the bottom. Everybody on the planet Earth is going to go, why, how, right, when? You know, those those classic questions. So we're not asking anybody listening to do more than they do in normal life when they have an anomaly in front of them, except that these are the more global ones these are the more universal ones they have a more of a metaphysical permutation you know just like we started off is it extraterrestrial or is it supernatural has anybody even formulated the question to notice that there's a dichotomy there that must be answered because if it's not answered then you are condemning our planet to the rule of the priest and as devils and as fear right the supernatural right it's under your bed and all that you are condemning future generations to something that is completely irrational Therefore, you know, the, the wise man sets out to say, I'm going to I'm going to look into that as I look into intelligent design as opposed to, you know, the opposite of that. Right. Uh, I'm going to look into, like we said in a previous podcast, the Gnostics and Christians and or ancient Jews didn't have even remotely the kind of technology that would notice the energy of the earth. Right. The, the mathematical structure of Earth and its eco ecology and all of that, they didn't have. So, of course, you can have Gnosticism that looks at the place like a cage of the soul. But there's nobody on the planet today that should even be daring to call themselves a Gnostic. You might as well call yourselves a cave dwelling, cave crawling primitive. Right. Because we have the technology that has wasted Gnosticism. We know that, you know, by looking at a tiny snowflake, by looking at uh, any, anything you want subatomic particles and their behavior right the earth is incredibly intelligent look at the science of light that wasn't known to these people so as sophisticated as certain tribes and groups were they were sort of a minority even back then right you don't get the box saga situation in every country in the world right you don't get these dionysian artificers or these druids everywhere you're still talking about a, 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 a planet populated by you know basically animal pig-headed imbeciles right you get this in the tribes and you get it everywhere so so the jews back then these canaanite uh, the ones that you know dominate our world were not advanced people 
if they were they wouldn't have called the phoenicians in to build the temple of solomon right so we have evidence right there that our world has been dominated by priest archies that were the stupidest and most uncivilized people that's what christianity is that's what judaism is study its roots and it's not very impressive the antics of the their god are so utterly cruel callous and bizarre just read the book of job in fact you got in the stuff in book of job that makes it no sense that satan's actually an emissary of god going and doing his bidding try that one on for size right? but just the fact that he tortures a good and just man explain that you fucking christian idiot and all the other tyrannical you know it's no good to just say well I, i'm not old testament i'm new testament as if that moving the goalposts they're going to save your reputation you see but what these people do not expect and it's relevant to this subject matter as well that one or two people is going to pick up the slack in their own fucking time in a day where you have to make a crust of bread where people don't want to feel like an outsider look at them all wearing their fucking masks and all that i mean look at the fucking state of the human race so these these people who dispense a lie never expected a maverick to pick up the slack like has been done in this alter, alternative movement to go and collate the information that makes a pig's ear of their entire lives from top to bottom everything you know is wrong everything the people who taught you know is wrong all your misleaders i'm exposing them they didn't expect this movement they didn't expect people like that and they were right because there isn't many of them around but that doesn't mean that you can't do it now as i said this is the chief time to do it and this uh so you can come at this hollow earth thing you know from a fictional point of view because let me tell you something 80 percent of every science fiction film or document uh, not documentary but uh you know famous series like doctor who or blake seven or space 1999 or star trek 80 percent of the scenarios feature hollow earth there's a huge percentage of even in horror films you know and you might not notice it they're going down in an elevator you know like in the movie war games or whatever uh, you're not kind of aware that they're going down into a grotto or into a simulacra of the hollow earth but it's there because you don't know how to read the symbolism right but in just science fiction alone the motif of hollow earth here's a good example star trek 2 the wrath of khan go watch that movie with educated eyes why they call the device genesis that brings life to dead planets but why is genesis first experiment underground in a, in, a, in a network of caves and then it looks like edenic it's like the garden of eden they almost they don't say that word but they i think one of them's eating an apple you know it's quite obvious what they're talking about go and watch that movie and others like it and just note just don't conclude don't you know conclude just draw just note how much that image of the hollow earth is in some sense right featured and you'll already be on to something you'll already have one of the keys to decipherment in your hands just by noting just observing not not concluding or believing or disbelieving just noting and that's how you do it that's how you do it through all these subjects you just note and you ask a question and and you move from that point to the next thing right just because you, you you first draw in a little thread that becomes a rope right the rope becomes a big chain and, and the next thing you got a, you know a whale in the room in front of you that's how it works with the truth as well it, it's you go out in a fishing expedition with no particular you know you just go on a little holiday to Malta and you go down in those catacombs, you know, or over to Egypt and look at the the, the great sarcophagi there in, in uh, Saqqara, right? Or even the one in the coffer in the, in, the, in, the, in the king's chamber, you know? And you start asking questions and it will lead. There's, so there's nothing, there's nothing dogmatic where some group of people are telling you, do this, do that. It's your own curiosity to awaken and your own sensitivity and then pick up a book or two, you know, and, and go from there. And don't let everybody else shout you down when you're on your own journey. You're looking into this to find out what, you know, you're going to form your own opinion. It's something people are really scared to do. But think about it. You know, if we're going to go out there and have conversations, I mean, it doesn't mean we always know exactly, you know, there's so much mis mystery when you look into the ancient history. But, um, you know, you're on the path of being open-minded enough to receive new information that might change your opinion. Whereas other people, they've kind of made their opinion up 20 years ago. That all calcifies in the brain, shuts down the whole open mind concept, puts them in a tunnel vision. And then you just try to go, hey, you know what? Uh, yeah, it looks like the pyramids were built a lot sooner than the Egyptian empire. So what's up with that? Or it looks like uh, half the Bible was mistranslated and thrown out in the garbage and nobody knows about that. What does that do? And you just go and, and they're just like, no, no, no. You know, you just get to a point where you say, well, fine, then everybody's on their own journey. And, but don't let that 
deter you from staying on your own journey. You know, that's all I did for myself. I'm fascinated by this. And I'm always wondering, why am I fascinated by it? Why am I, even with this whole pandemic thing, why am I naturally curious to find out if there might be other doctors, scientists, and experts that have a different opinion than the World Health Organization or Bill Gates? Why, why am I, cu I'm curious. It's a curiosity that wasn't destroyed in me by the academia because I didn't get schooled like that. So, but other people aren't even curious. They're just like, as soon as you start talking, hey, it's kind of interesting, you know, there's 2,600 doctors that disagree with the thing. Or the guy that invented the test that everybody's relying on all these numbers, he, he came out and said that this test isn't used for these influenza viruses. Isn't that interesting? They're like, they're, no, it can't be. And why would that be, Michael? With this subject, with any subject, you're the one that opened up the book on it. It has to do with psychology. Psychology is rooted in trauma and repression. So is trauma and angst and all that kind of stuff just a product of our lives today? Or maybe you could give a little bit of a summary of the idea of a catastrophe of this, even this, if there was some visitation, what that might have done to stunt or change or alter the growth of the psyche of human beings, right? Because that, that's a factor. And then these elite priestarchies who work on behalf of who knows what, they know how to manipulate and push all those buttons like a switchboard. Well, we're run by institutionalization. You know, it, it has a lot. You can come at it from different angles, from a philosophical angle or from these alt alternative angles. Uh, you can come at it, just my latest article, it's called uh, In God and Ruins, about devolution. It's not that I believe it, but, you know, I've read Michael Cremo. I'm fascinated. Like you're saying, I'm open-minded. Right? Most of my looking at it doesn't quite buy into their theory, but there's a thread of truth there because there are elements. Like, for instance, even you're talking about disease. I didn't put this into the article, but there's a concept that because the human body can, in fact, you know, because of its organs and its constitution, come down with literally so many diseases, right, that that alone is a proof of devolution. Because once, when we were different kinds of being, we had an immune system that, you know, that just wasn't the reality. I know I'm talking a little theosophical here, but again, I can pick up things because, you know, I'm not urinating on it. I'm not saying this is, you know, off limits. And in the theory of devolution, the very fact that man is plagued with cancers, plagued with, shows an infirmity, right? You see? Uh, and that infirmity would tell another person, yeah, well, that's the proof we're talking about. The man is a fallen, is a god in ruins. Just his physicality, right? Or you can come at it from the Reikian way, you know, and there's other ways to come at these things. But that's what I want. I want to have an omnidirectional understanding of things with the hope that I'm getting to the understanding of it. But that's not a simple journey. That's not straight down in any kind of way. It's a very spiralic idea where you have to keep walking around a thing, keep posing the question. And then even more where the philosophy comes in, you must love the questioning. Because there's certain answers that won't come unless you do. And you can beat it over the head and you can keep at it. But until you fall in love with the act of questioning, the answer will always remain remote. That's a law, a philosophical law, by the way. It's why most of the questions that somebody like Plato and Aristotle answered, you know, asked back then, uh, 3, 300 years BC, still haven't been answered. Okay? Hundreds and hundreds of points. We've made almost no progress in all of the years on, on certain, on, in certain areas, right? But... <clears throat> The institutionalization, say, take the medical, which, again, what, what are we learning from 2020? Well, everyone should learn right now that the people who call themselves medics and physicians know fucking nothing about immunity or real health. They are good at prevention of disease. And even then, they want to sell you a product and dispense some poison that has more side effects than the original disease. You have to know about that. And you've also got to decide for yourself whether you're going to confront these men in the white coats should you ever come in front of them and then set the ball rolling where they now know you're a fucking, you know, renegade into the center or you have to sort of meet them halfway and act like a dumbass you know and play play your own game you know these are all questions people have to ask because there's actual danger in getting into the machine by confronting them and going you're a bunch of fucking fakes these are very, these are knights templars that you know when you dig down deep in these are very powerful cult these men in the white coats so you have you have to pick you know what you want to do with that but but you know before you walk in that these are institutionalized brains right they don't know anything about health. They only know about disease and its treatment, right? And then you go over here and you go over there and you go over here and, and you start to deconstruct it, right? That's a lot of work. That's a lot of work for people to look into. Why is ca capitalism really, you know, corporate socialism? Why, is, why, did the, why did any of these liberalistic movements become so radically leftist? How did that actually happen? Who are its advocates? 
Are we really talking Marxism or are we talking about the hybrid of Marcuse? And what's the difference? You see, this all takes time. Sure, I can't have no fun. I can't be dancing and clicking my heels if I, if I have to go into all of that. But the good news is that a lot of people are discovering this now. And a lot of people are saying, you know, I've got the time. This lockdown is providing everybody with time. Yeah. Time to do the right thing. And, and believe me, those opportunities come apart. It's whether you seize it or not. When the, when the ship is, you know, not even able to move a couple of inches because there's no wind for the sails. And you find yourself, what are you going to do? You just have to kick back. There's nothing you can do. You can't even get out and push. So you have to just, uh, it's called the doldrums. Yeah. Are you going to be the man who knows, oh, what rewards I have with the doldrums? How I can turn that into priceless gold? Because I'm going to pick up that book. I'm going to scan that website. I'm going to really, you know, set along a research that I had to set aside earlier. You know, and I'm going to, I'm going to, get back on track with that or i'm going to deconstruct right i'm going to take something up and i'm going to take it apart i don't believe it yeah we'll start with physics start with uh, medical health <laughs> you know start with um uh, start with uh, the secret societies of the world and their connection to satanic pedophilia you know <clears throat> how many Irish people know that jerry rice was a, a jerry uh uh I'm thinking of the football player. Uh, how many people know that Jerry Adams and his coterie were pedophiles? The leaders of the IRA and Sinn Féin were pedophiles. How many know that they were Islamo-communists? What, 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 what connection could the IRA possibly have with you know, the Palestinians or the Islam? Oh, yeah, well, why don't you try, try and find out? Right. So when I read these books by these great men, and, and you just showed Phil Snyder and his work there, you see, that is what I love. When I use the word love, I use it in that context. Those are precious books to me, right? Etta Dorfa, you know, Ch Hatcher Childress, Ralph Ellis. You know, my hands shake when I used to pick those books up. They were precious to me. I, I went hungry and poor, you know, to, to, to make sure that these books, some of them were hundreds of dollars, you know, would be bought and, re and not only bought, but read. You know, because and, and I never look back on that. Never, even, no matter how much, agony and you know all the rest of it was you know uh befell me on that path i have still stood strong and said the hell with it you know it was worth it because the the real knowledge is like going through a labyrinth in the dark you know but uh yeah you have to you have to value it and when you value it you know a different sort of action happens and then you're not really concerned about all the detractors and the scoffers and all of that you see or other resistances that, that come up, you know, with people pirating your work or <clears throat> literally magpieing your work or whatever. You see, you can withstand all of that stuff because what you're doing is so vital and it's a continual process of, of further revelation. Now, to back it up, like I said, I'll, I'll say it again. I then take, I look into the science world and find out its latest discoveries and they often corroborate, not just my work, but say a Beaumont or whatever, and I make sure those are available for people. So when you come to my work, be prepared to dislike it because it is so well proven. You know, have a have a bad day. These especially these intellectual types who want to come and you know refute you and just scoff at you. But they find eminent people ten times smarter than them reference all the time. And I do that because this knowledge is sacrosanct. And when we present it to the world, we have a duty to make sure that it is in a nice setting, and so that these lunatic low level people so many of them with degrees but that see just because your stuff is like take it <clears throat> take a uh, peer reviewing of a book or a article it means nothing you can be peer reviewed from every single collegiate in the world from leningrad from moscow university to tel aviv right to paris to the sorbonne whatever it doesn't mean anything it still doesn't mean that you're not right it still doesn't mean that your work is full of holes Right? You could be peer-reviewed by everybody in the book, and some little Walter Russell who's never even seen the light of day is right and you're wrong. It means nothing. It's just more institutionalization. Your work could still be full of contradictions, full of holes. Peer review my ass, right? Especially today. And you know, wasn't every geological paper? You know, I don't know about uh, Geike, uh, uh, Aguizes, and Lyle, and all. Were they all peer reviewed? Yeah, well, they're all fucking wrong. It took a Emmanuel Velikovsky or a Beaumont to come and tell you, you know, here's how it really happened. Right? Everybody that refuted uh, Thomas L. Thompson, I bet you they were all peer reviewed, all these biblicists and archaeologists. What did it mean? They're all wrong. 
They still don't know how the pyramid was built. They still don't know what you know dynasties existed before Egypt. They're still telling you blatant lies about the Egyptians and their customs and habits. The lies that are told with Ireland, oh my God, you'd need another millennia to uh, you know, scrape that off. The lies about the papacy, the lies about the Jesuits, right? The lies about masonry, the lies you know, against uh, other forms of conspiracy. There's so many layers of lies. So this is excavation, you know, and, and now, believe me, not everybody is, you know, going to be honed into it or, you know, be, but they don't need to be. Because we've got people like myself who do it, and then you know we hand you the results. But see, when I hand the results to the world, it is not of any concern to me what they think about it. My work is done vocationally, right? And then that's it at that point. But but who in, the, in this world has ever realized that these ley lines were there partly for good, right? So that the earth could be healed from ancient cataclysm like you just spoke of, but then was co-opted by later races who wanted to bury not just you know, beings, but other caches of other things at certain vertices where they'd use the earth's protection. How many people have wondered about the ritual of burial? Right? They do it. Every, you know, it happens all the time. Whoever thought about where the custom came from? And so on and so on and so on. So, yeah, it's about an open mind. But unfortunately, we have, the, we have these institutions of complete and utter, right? Uh, So-called civilization, right? But they're not. They're cancerous groups that are actually uh, bringing the death of civilization you know and, and of course one of the pillars of that is western civilization well that's being chewed at and gnawed so if that pillar falls don't you see the whole temple of civilization anywhere could be could be uh, you know could fall and fall on what the rats of this idiotic extreme leftist whose own paradigms are so contradictory right they're inherently contradictory relativism Right? None of you can be right. There's no objective truth. You mean except yours? Well, yeah, that's right. Everything I believe uh, is right, and I also want to have that institutionalized. The shit I believe must be believed by you and everybody else. Yeah, but that just contradicts your first statement that there's no objective truth. Crickets. <laughs> yeah, but we're the exception. We're the exception. So shut up. We're gonna defund you. We're gonna silence you. We're gonna we're gonna squash your free speech. Don't point out contradictions of myself to myself. I'll, I'll explode, uh, right? You'll just be, my head will just, you know, melt. You have no rights to tell me that I'm living a lie and that I'm spreading it like an infection throughout the whole planet. Well, okay. And everybody just sits back and is accepting that, right? We have to look at it. It's, it's running the streets in madness. Yeah, and then you, you you tell me I don't want to look at the psychology of why people let this happen. Sure, you can shout these guys down. The monkeys and an idiot, an idiot. They're idiots. You could you could shout them down in seconds. Why haven't people done it? Where are all the eminent people? Where are all the psychologists to say, well, it's just a bunch of constitutional moral and fears and neurotic. Sorry, here's you know, here's a few points of how to deal with them. Right? Why has the Western mind not learning from all of these other? groups to say they're sacrosanct they matter right not one of these people from any of the universities who preach multiculturalism have ever studied anything about the history of the cultures that they champion you know in africa or india they don't know anything about their religions they don't know anything about their structures they talk, they, for years and years the original feminists talk about matriarchy which which fell into the hole it's a complete lie there never were any matriarchal societies all right the presence of women and their influence was was there in tribes, but it was never a matriarchy. It was a different format. They've had to accept that now. But book after book after book after book and lecture after lecture from all the prestigious colleges of the world it took this Maria Gimbetus nonsense and these Margaret Meads and all the other slosh that they had, you know, could concoct and taught this from the academics, from the academic platforms of the world. Not one bit of it is true. And we, I could go on out and find with other, you know, acts of disinformation. Who stood up and refuted it? So we have to, we have uh, need no faith in any of this institutionalized stuff. But the one thing you have is that we will build new colleges, new schools, more conservative, more rational, and we'll do it. We'll build it from scratch if need be. That's the solution oriented. So again, the message is never negative. If those ones didn't work and they failed the crud, right? And th those were poisoning the mind with a socialistic, communistic nonsense, is Marcuse nonsense. Guess what? 
We'll just build new ones that don't allow that kind of scum. You see, you put the teachers on probation and you make sure that only healthy things are taught. Things that are rational, honed by time. Relativism. Deconstruction, you know, post-humanism, post postmodernism. Determinism. They, yeah, they contradict themselves. How can you speak against objective truth and then say that only your truth is then the one to be that's non-subjective, that's you know, that is truly objective? That's tyranny, that's fascism when one group says, I want my see it's not relativism, it is the uh, cover. Relativism is just a cover for saying I want our paradigm to be the dominant one throughout the whole world. It's fascism pure and some it's probably the essence of fascism. It's like if you imagine it was in a household where any one tyrannical, brutal, cruel, sadistic, illogical, irrational, schizophrenic person suddenly did in fact have a whip big enough to say everything I'm about, right? If I say the moon is made of cheese, right? It is. If I say black is white, it is. And that's the kind of world we're going into and we're letting it happen, right? So there's, you know, I'm not fatalistic. I think that a great thing is going to come out of this. But the thing is that uh, we should never forget, you know, this year and the contradictions. Mark those down and don't let them fade away with time because these are vital things to remember about the kind of mentality that's running the streets right now and is in government right now. And it's important to see total institution, governmentality, adultism, things I've been talking for years and people just, you know, glaze over. Now is your chance to actually take a reading of these things and discover their anatomy. Yeah, it's it's amazing what you've you threaded into it because it all it didn't just rise up this this uh, hysterical way of looking at things and the the lies and all that and the loons running around the political strife the social strife that didn't just suddenly happen because it's the twenty first century it's it's something that goes back and it's something that's rooted in trauma and it's something that's rooted in a lot of things and a lot of lies and deception people have been. Uh, as, as Schneider was saying and many others and we're saying people have been misled, propagandized, lied to, outright manipulated. Um, you know, their consciousness has been tortured. They've been shut off from the great minds of people that were just looking, as you said, in a vocational way, that were genius minds that brought different ways of looking at things together. They were edited out and censored out of our reality. The children are not taught this, right? And you get to this point where here we are, with this global situation and the push for this new world order that people like me have been talking about forever. The, these elites, they want to centralize power even more. They want to change it up, you know, 2.0, upgrade, whatever. Um, and now it's right in front of everybody's face. So that's why I know instinctively, and I know from the comments I'm getting and the emails I'm getting and the conversations I'm having, that people are now starting to realize, yeah, there's something else going on. And all I can say is, pull up a seat, man. Pull up a seat and I'll tell you how long things have been going wrong, how deep it goes, literally and figuratively, how far off the map we are on so many different things, including the very origins of where we come from. Look, at, we're walking around saying, oh, we need peer reviews. We need all this stuff official, whatever, before it's truth. We're all traumatized and we've, we don't even know where we came from. We can't even settle that debate. The Darwinists and the creationists have been battling it out for decades. Ever. This was one of the points uh, Lloyd Pye, God rest his soul, brought up in one of his fantastic books, Everything You Know Is Wrong, which is an, a brilliant statement because it's important to approach subjects like that. And he's like, what about a different way of looking at what if you're going to have two forces battling it out forever and ever and ever, isn't there another place? Isn't there something else missing? That's why they're able to battle it out. And, and one, day the determ one day the Darwinists get the edge, one day the creationists gets the edge, and you go, well, but something's missing. Let's look in the middle. And then nobody even knows who Lloyd Pye is. The guy had to die without even being able to finish mm -hmm. his experiments, you know, sadly. But good thing he wrote these and books. Good thing we collected them, and we can keep him alive and ideas like that alive by doing this work and doing this from a place of sincerity and integrity. Uh, we had, uh, who, who's ever heard of Augustus Le Plongeon? They not only talked about the Maya culture, mm. he categorically linked it to the, you know, the Egyptian culture. <clears throat> the, the establishment came down on him. You know, this is in the 1800s, right? Barry fell in the 20th century. The establishment came down on him. We had a guest several times on uh, Richard Cassaro, remember? He was yep, talking about the dispersion of all <clears throat> incredible work on uh, how the triad, you were talking earlier about the Phrygians and the, the Etruscans. One trait that a lot of these, all of these different nations had in common was the triad. 
whether it was in a pantheon, whether it was with the divinities, whether it was in architecture, you see, <coughs> it wasn't just the Pythagoreans. That's a hallmark. So is it goddess related? Is it some other sort of geometry? Is it some worship of Orion or whatever, you know? And so you look, start looking, you develop pattern recognition that even though the gods of the earth or the gods of the storm, you know, are different names in different cultures, you know, Dionysus, Prometheus, whatever, you start to see that behind the name is, is, is an archetype. So as you develop this knowledge, you start getting into your Youngs and your, your Joseph Campbells, you know, but you find out, see, as I said before, when I would discover, you know, another great maverick, like an Alvin Boyd Kuhn or Albert Churchward or Mercy Eliad or Augustus Laplongeon, that's what I lived for, right? That, that was the beads on my necklace. That was like, oh, that's another notch in the gun. That is what I live for, not sitting down and talking to a bunch of fucking arseholes, right, who, who, who believe in some Marxist nonsense or any of the above, right? Learning about sacred geometry, learning about gematria, right? Learning about different, I, know, I believe in magic, right? I'm an, uh, uh, I wouldn't call myself an occultist, but I'm an I'm esotericist. My work is cut out for me. That's a tradition. But I don't set these narrow things. Well, that's Kabbalah. I can't go over it. I'm not going to study that. Or goddess traditions, right? Or this or that and the other. It's all open because we've left the realm of the piss artists, right? Who want to urinate. You know, once you've gone into the temple of the holy place, it's not the marketplace. That's back there. You're now in the sanctum, right? And it's only your own sensitivity and your own uh, love of truth, right? That matters. The world no longer matters. You know, so that's what, that, that's the, uh, I'm not preaching that to anybody else. It's just the, the way I have approached this work, right? Because when you when I found out the work of these people, these great scholars, to me, that was the treasure, right? And, and it really is the treasure. It's what's, it's what's going to make you sane because you can't go against this beast out there in any shape or form, not even these loonies who are running around now who are very low level. But that, that great oppressive force, right, which has conditioned the minds of all of these people is very, very powerful. You know, it's like a big dragon or whatever. I call it the predator in the long grass. You cannot go after it unless you're totally suited up and you've got the silver bullets, you know, and you've got the skill to use it. So all of these things that we're saying, that is going to discount a lot of people who will never, no matter what you do, come around this information, you know. And also we're not dogmatic, so we're not, we're not begging them to do it. You've got to fall in love with the process. See, if you didn't, then how could, you know, the suicide rate right now, people just checking out because... If you didn't do it from love, you couldn't get through a particular time like this that to a lot of people seems very, very frightening, very, very dark and oppressive. I've never thought about that one time in all of this mess, right? Because when you're intelligent, you're on very strong ground, right? It's like I'm using, it's like Aikido. I use the force of the other person against him. His head is going to crack of his own charging at me. Just step aside and they're done. Right? Because the man has gotten fucking intelligence. And I've backed it up with L.A. Waddell and Commons Beaumont and Augustus Laplongeon and Barry Fell and Kersey Graves and fucking Gerald Massey. Right? We're mighty. You are a fucking weak loser. You're jelly. And you can bring all the degrees and the peer reviews. Right? I got my Lloyd Pies, man. I've got, you know, the greats. I've got my Ralph Ellis's. Go figure. Right? They'll never take these people on. They'll never, and if they do it, they'll just do it from afar, you know, throwing stones or, you know, throwing muck. Or more important, censoring. Shut up. Don't yeah. remind me of my lunacy. Don't hold up a mirror to my lunacy. I'm going to rule the world. Well, they're giving it their best shot. And actually, it's failing. Anyone who really looks beneath the headlines now, George Soros and Bill Gates and these people are not happy campers. They are losing because there's yeah. just enough sane, logical, smart people who go, the more you talk, the more I know you're a liar. The more you speak, I know you're a worm tongue. Keep talking. I'm photographing you. I'm recording. And everything you say is contradictory, right? including the core philosophies that have animated you, you know, the feminism and all the rest. All of it is so bankrupt. And now, why I'm not pessimistic about the, these in 2020 is because this is the best time for even a layman now to see that, which we would have to really, you know, pull teeth for them to realize a few things about the left uh, and who's been ruling the world under the name of communism and Islamo-communism, all the things we look at. It's actually a little bit more palatable now. I put this little slide up and I said 75%, this is actual fact, 75% of Americans confess that they're f afraid to speak their minds. Thanks very much.
because you've just proven every con rational conspiracy theorist 100% correct about their predictions of what's going to come down. So can we move on now? Right, the way is open, unless you're bat fucking crazy. Well, I think that we've won our spots. We've won our stripes. The conspiracy person, the rational one, like the Lloyd Pies and you know the G.A.R. Griffins and all these people who predicted an Orwellian future are 100% correct. It's like Bo Greitz, you know, Lieutenant Colonel said, there's only one truth, and that's the whole truth. Right. Right. And that's what we're looking for. And if, if you fault me for that, just because, oh, there's errors here, or there's a little faux pas there, or there was, you know, a, 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 a cul-de-sac there, you know, dead end over there, well, then I don't want you on the team. Because in the journey I'm going on, I don't look at mistakes. I look at challenges. I'm getting stronger for every mistake I make, for every challenge, for every nitwit that I have to deal with, right? Every knucklehead, every flunky, right? And most of them have degrees. Yeah, but then, you know, so what? You, no matter what degree you have, you're not pissing on knowledge. I will not allow it, right? You're not going to territorialize gnosis. And that's what they're doing. The ones who run the magazines, the ones who run the newspapers, the ones who run the collegiates of the world are filthy degenerates who have not only killed off mavericks and shut them down, but do it right now in school. And there's many people who confess about this. There's many even degreed people have come out to whistleblow what actually happens, you know, in the whole structure of how you get a degree and what you got to go through. It's all politics. It's nothing to do with the actual love of knowledge uh, and looking at a thing you know, from a uh, non-partisan point of view. That's long, long gone. That's why nitwits that you're seeing on TV every day, these talking heads, have PhDs and degrees. They had to lower the goddamn bar so that a fucking imbecile, right? So the cave crawlers could pass, and now you are, they're lecturing you about what they know. Or they're coming at you with vaccines saying, you know, we know all about it. You know nothing about the human immune system. You know nothing about the person who doesn't take your medicine. You have not screened those people. So what do you know? Since everybody in the world takes your medicine, you have no paradigm past the person who won't take it because you've never screened or studied those people. How could you? Because everyone exactly. folds up and takes the medication. Right. So that's the limit of your paradigm. The holistic person is has screened and looked at the people right, who refuse to take a particular medication for a particular thing and home treat and self-treat. But the, every single physician you know has zilch, zero knowledge about that. Because by definition, everybody takes their cure. Right, well, then what do you know about that disease and how it could, could be cured in other ways if you didn't take the, you know, the medication? Well, you know nothing. Right, so your paradigm is more limited than mine. But how many people know how to articulate that? How many people today when they're telling you oh, it's mandatory to take the masks? No, it's not. Go to a civil rights lawyer and ask him if that's the case. Right. There's no laws on the books that can force anybody to do that. But as I've always said, forget politics. Go to legalese. Find out about your actual rights. And you will soon see that when you go to court, the fears of your government don't matter in court. The fears of, your, of the medical profession have no say in court. Because you cannot, let's put it this way, you cannot offend the government. You can only offend your neighbor or, you know, driving in the car or another witness you know, you can offend a, a, another human being. A human, a human citizen cannot offend an institution. So an institution has no rights over your life at all. You don't even, and, and that's, you're not even being sovereign. You know, one would have hoped that people have gone a little bit further into sovereignty and corporate, soul and, you know, corporate uh, coverage and all of that. But even without that, no institution, it's called a corp, which means a dead thing. Yeah, it's called corp because that's a legal term that when you when an institution tries to take you to court over something, they're considered dead in the court. You're the living one. And then you say, well, who's, who's, who witnessed me offending? Like, let me give you an example. When the federal government turned up in Waco, now these guys were boogaloo. I might have been going down to take care of them. But in real life, right, when the federal government came to take out David Koresh, all Koresh had to do was get a top lawyer from New York and go, who have I offended? I'm crazy. I keep all these women and children locked up. But how have I offended the federal government? How have I offended Janet Reno personally? And the answer is, you haven't. We've just turned up at your door because we feel offended. Yeah, and what legal precedent do you have? Because if you feel offended, then there could be thousands of, you know, who are you going to turn up next? Grizzly Adams up in his little shack in Canada? You're offended by the fact that he, you know, didn't paint his barn properly? Or, or he wears red plaid instead of blue? 
right? So the courts don't have anything to do with this. So I, my, my message to people is to arm themselves with you know, their legalese, to stop all of this. There is no law on the books that can make you wear a mask or be vaccinated or anything like that because you have to have an offended party in the freaking court before anything can violate your civil rights. This is another thing we could go on endlessly about, uh, but you know, the, the point is made. But the point I'm really making is people don't. People have, have run into politics and they're not doing enough on, and never do. I don't care if it's 9-11, the SARS you know, thing, uh, Ebola, any violation from a parking ticket up, right? We operate in the dark legally. And that's a tremendous weakness because your Knights Templars, your Knights of Malta, and all of your papacy and Jesuits are all sovereign to that degree. They're all diplomatic bag. They're all, uh, you know, uh, for the most part, unimpeachable. There are obviously exceptions to that, right? But well, even the Knights general, of Malta, just to say, I, there's actually, I've seen the, they have the little tags on all the desks of the UN that sit around the round table. Knights of Malta sits above everybody. And on its tag, it says the sovereign order of the Knights of Malta. So just so that you know that, yeah. yeah. And why is it that Sweden has had no lockdown, including Japan and other places? Because they're neutral. Southern Ireland's meant to be neutral. So they break the rules. But Switzerland, Sweden, Belgium, Ireland right, are all neutral, which means they can give the thumb to any edict of the United Nations, right, or anyone. Uh, that's the, and Sweden has actually used that, right? right? Ireland hasn't yet, but, you know, Sweden does. How could they even do that? It's legal protection. It's not political protection, folks. It's legal protection. They're legally neutral, right? Vatican City is sovereign. The city of London, where the Templar buildings are, you've been there and done a lot of stuff there. That's a sovereign zone, right? Um, so there are laws right on the books, laws of evidence, laws of disclosure. Where's my witness? Who have I offended? You know, I, I, I look, you know, I'm getting tired telling people this. I'm tired because when I see so much devastation done to people's lives and they don't know anything about it, you know, whether they should have arms, whether they should use those arms on a crowd and all. Look, do you know your legalese or not? It's in the fucking constitution that you can do so and defend your rights. And don't be afraid of any of those judges. Don't be afraid of the court because that's all about actual laws that are on the books in black and white that cannot be violated, right? The only way it will go wrong is if you're a nitwit and you're coming in with antagonism or you're coming in with, you know, fuck the system attitude. Well, they'll pick that up right away and you're fucked, you know, and, and of course, other other things need to be done as well. But so it's not as easy as I'm saying, but it, it is easy for a, a middle class, intelligent person, actually, you know, to, to, to do this. It certainly is energy efficient. You'll get more out of you know protecting yourself legally than all the histrionics that you're trying to do in the political milieu, which really is you know a, a treading on water. That really does change, and goalposts can move overnight. In the legal profession, it's less likely. And the more professional you are at it, and, and also one thing I should say is when I talk about legalese, I'm talking about within the system of law, not outside it like these other people advocate. You know, a lot of those guys got thrown in point. jail. It's interesting, yeah. And they will, they will. No, I'm talking about what's already in the laws of evidence and what's already in disclosure and witness, you know, the file, the actual clerk's file, your actual case file, uh, which is sacrosanct. Uh, you know, a little bit of education there, a little bit of education on that can be immensely helpful because the only people you can offend are other human beings. You cannot offend institutions and you can't offend the government. And therefore, they have no right to come and, uh, you know, uh, penalize you. For, and they'll do it, you know, through the strong arm te technique of the oligarchy, right? Which is just a, a thugocracy, you know, but, but it doesn't hold a cent in court. And, and that's why you should be very, very up on your legality. So that when some piss pot at a local store goes, where's your mask? Get out of my store. You go, you call them over quietly and you say, look, let me tell you a couple of things, right? Uh, I come from a long line of physicians, just to make up a lie. So, and we know a lot about immunity and my immune system is very, very strong. So just take care of yourself. You know, you're good. I support what you feel it will be good for your health. But because you're wearing that mask, it doesn't mean you've got the right to then interfere with what I do for my health, mate. Just the way you're taking care of your health with wearing that thing, I'm taking my care of my health without. So the twain do not meet. You have no right to tell me any more than I've got the right to snatch that mask from your face, throw hot coffee over you or whatever else, you know, and you, you try to go with that and you always do it very 
cordially. And if they keep persisting or they're irate, you just say, let me, is this your shop? Is this your store? Are you the owner? You go, yeah, well, look, do you want a civil lawsuit? I mean, the coronavirus is not going to close you down, but my my civil lawsuit on you personally for inter interfering with my civil rights, mate, that will shut you down and that will impoverish your family. Do you, I'm giving you the chance. Do you want to continue? Because I'll be calling my you know legal representative within the hour and you'll be given a summons in a civil court for damages. And by the way, that is exactly what you can do. It doesn't have to be you know a car bumping into you or whatever. There's damages for wasting your time even for delaying you and for accosting you in that way. The man, the person has no rights. It's not a criminal action, but you can sue civilly. And you can, even if even if the end comes and you're not actually really paid anything, yeah, but you've fucking given that guy a run around. And I don't know about America where litigation is often more common and people are not as afraid of it, but in places like Britain and Europe, the very, the very threat that you're gonna take into court, that they have to hire their own lawyer to defend against your lawyer, it's path, ask anybody from England and Ireland, you know, that is a immediately puts them into hyperventilation. They're just because in America, you know, it's a totally different deal where everybody's going, I'm not going to sue your ass. I'm gonna sue. But in Britain and other places, it hasn't. So it's just, you know, another little anecdote about the fact that please use your legal power. Don't be picking up cudgels. Don't be getting into fist fights about, you know, that you support Trump and, and somebody else doesn't or you're right wing and left wing. Please, 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 let's evolve from that. And you start using real power. You start using the law. That is, you know, I've been saying it from day one. It's what I learned from day one. And you know where I learned it from? Eustace Mullins. There's a source I, you know, pick up his book called Rape of Justice, folks. And you come back and tell me that you're talking a lot of rubbish. Read Rape of Justice by Eustace Mullins. And, you can, and that's not the only one I read, but by God, that is a towering monument book, just like his other ones are. You know, uh, murder by injection, but, but pick up this rape of justice, please, and read it, and then and mull over what he's saying there. And there's a few, I think there's a few online, you know, things where he talks about rape of justice. You might be able to find a video or two about it as well. But definitely read the book because that is a masterpiece of masterpieces. Yeah, it's incredible. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, and it's it is relative actually because Eustace Mullins, or not relative, it's related. Um, Eustace Mullins also wrote a book that partly inspired me to contact you about this show. I didn't even bring it up. I, I almost forgot, which is horrible of me. Um, he wrote a book. I, I can't remember the exact name. Curse right of now. Canaan? Yeah, that's it. Curse of Canaan. And he gets into the groups, the Shem. He gets into a lot. Of, so he also writes about the ancient history and the idea that there was something to this fallen angel concept and, there was, and it's permeated throughout these different groups. And then, you know, he had his ideas on what happened with the Jews, but you've extrapolated even further to get in. Okay, we got to dice it up and real. who are the Sabbateans? Who are these different groups? Um, what do they believe? What do they not believe? We can't indict all people from this one group. It's very specific. Um, I'm not even saying he does that. I just think it's an interesting concept that he brought up. Again, validating this whole theory we've been discussing that in these ancient texts, even in the Bible, even in the Torah, there are these descriptions of, uh, of what we've been discussing here today. So he writes on a lot of subjects. Yeah, he's a great man because although he does see everything from a Christian perspective, that doesn't invalidate it. right? You'd, like I say, it's not dogmatic. Why right. would we want to do to the Christians what they've done to us? <clears throat> C.S. Lewis, D.R.R. Tolkien, the priceless work. So he's coming at it from, you know, that Babylon is all bad and all, and, and, and that's not right. But at the same time, there's a lot of really good leads in the book. You know, British Israelitism in general, not that Mullins was a British Israelite, but I deal with that in the Irish Origins books, right? British Israelitism has a lot of really cool truths in it. You know, the one about Jesus coming to England and all of that. And, and, and it was relevant, but it just had to be further extrapolated by somebody like Ralph Ellis, right? And then you got these horrible, you know, aspects. But British Israelites, this group, was very open to the idea that there was, say, Gaelic influences or Irish influences in Judah. In, in, that's fantastic, right? That's where I first came across it. E. Raymond Capt, you know, Fred, Frederick Haberman, all of these people that are so fundamental to where I jumped off from, right? And the idea is, like I said, as I said, when you're looking at the Hall of Records in this way, everybody's right and everybody's wrong. There's stuff in Waddell that I, com uh, not Waddell, there's stuff in uh, Gerald Massey that I completely disagree with. But yet no man has had a greater effect on my thought. There's things in all of them that I disagree with, right? So this is not an act of championing in some grotesque way. 
Right. Right. This is right. A, a, a scholastic insight. There's there's fucking materials. I love Richard Dawkins' work in mm -hmm. a particular context. I love the, uh, Christopher Hitchens. Christopher I love Hitchens, his brother's yeah. work, who's a Christian. His brother, Peter, is one of my favorite people to read, and we're going to be doing lots of podcasts on Peter Hitchens' work down the line. He's a bona fide Christian. The two brothers couldn't even see eye to eye. I love them both. Now, that's I don't think that's a lot to ask. I really don't, right? I can take a fucking Jesuit and learn from them. Now, I don't know what you know. what's different to me that can do that. You know? Do you know how many Muslim poets that I can cite that I've read through all my life? I fucking hate Islam, right? But I adore Islamic poetry and Sufi poetry. And, and you know, the anecdotes could go on. I love their architecture. I love loads of elements of their culture. But, of course, there's repulsive stuff in, in their work. It would be the same with uh, you did a show because you've, you've been doing the subject of... Uh the criminal history of in women, which is not discussed, right? And you've gone into psychology, dragon mother, all of this kind of stuff. You've had some harsh criticisms of modern feminism and all these kinds of things. And so people that just sort of walk in there, they go, oh, well, Michael's a misogynist or you guys are misogynist because you're critiquing this person. And it's like, no, 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 hold on a second. Uh, you also did entire podcasts and books and articles dedicated to some of the greatest women that ever lived that wrote brilliant things it's nothing about that it's an idea that you're going after as a scholar to say there's some holes there and it's also having huge effects on the way children are raised it's having huge effects on how our society is being changed uh and you have to understand that when you're dealing with the forces of evil you know we've you, you've done brotherhood of death we've gone at all these things you have to look at the other side there are female cults i was even just looking at um i'll send you the email i was looking even at speaking of the knights of malta there's what's called the, the Dames of Malta, which is a whole female right. order that wear the same garb and they're, you know, the Queen of England and all that are related to it. So, I mean, it's, it, you're looking at it from so many different areas and one day we'll be critiquing what's going on in China. One day we'll be critiquing what's going on with the Christian camp, with the Jewish camp, with the Muslim camp, with the men, with the women. This is an eclectic work to try to get to the truth of everything, right? That's right. And of course, uh, see, this is not bashing. This is extrapolating scholastically on a particular subject. It's a thoroughly, it's thoroughly, and see that one I don't mind people coming at me because I know the subject through and through. There's not an aspect of female psychology I don't know and haven't studied. So you're going to lose straight up, right? That one is covered. But again, it's not bashing. It's extrapolating on a subject that has fallen by the wayside. It's too taboo, you know, for a lot of other people to deal with. And as time came, and I waited even 21 years before I, you know, brought out my first work on that, so that it would be strong and correct. And there's no sign half the half the dedications are to women scholars that uh, you know that put me onto the right track. Your Karen Hornays and all that, right? So it's ludicrous, right? And obviously, the unbiased reader can see that so much new content is in there that's revelatory that isn't written by any other scholar, not even not even your Anna Freuds and people like that. I've taken it into you know different dimensions. There's not a sign of any woman bashing in any of that work. And so when when they see only that, that's the end of that conversation. Because I can't waste my time with somebody who, after reading it or whatever, checking it out, that's all you think it is. The wealth of what's there should tell you right away it's not. It's an incredible value for women. I've, and in fact, they even say in the books that everything that I'm writing about is only for women to pick up and work with because it's their story. Right, the, the renovation of the world, I'll say it again, the renovation of the modern world is in the hands of women, not men. Right? Men can comment, men can have a, you know derivative influence or whatever, but the ones who will really transform our world is women. What greater accolade that could you give? They're the ones with the skill to turn it all around. But to do that, they have to anatomize their own selves, their own minds, their own contradictions in history, contradictions in their psyche. Uh, they have to certainly analyze, you know, the semiotic levels and how they bring up children, you know, and the thetic level and the symbolic level. Uh, and also then inherently, really, I think the thing that's key is to look again, like I said about leftists in general, the inherent contradictions within their own paradigms. That doesn't take external critique, actually. It just tells them to step back for a minute and look at the inherent contradictions within their own paradigms, feminism, right? whatever it may be, multiculturalism, hatred of men, uh, the, the, the story, the narrative that they borrowed about patriarchy, right? Uh, their left, their socialistic leanings, 
All of this needs to be deconstructed. If they claim to be deconstructionists, then why are you immune to your own deconstruction? If you're a critical theorist, why is the last person on the planet that you criticize as yourselves? Why are you not part of your own philosophical paradigm? Do you realize that that bankrupts your paradigm by that very fact? And it doesn't matter how eminent right, the leaders of your movement are. It doesn't matter about the Gloria Steinems and the Kate Millets and all the rest of them, the Susan Sondheims and all of these. It doesn't matter who they are. Right? Go pick up Woman's Inhumanity to Woman by Phyllis Chesler, one of the leading original feminists, and read that book and come back to me and tell me I'm woman bashing. And that's just the start. Woman's Inhumanity to Woman. We've done podcasts on it. I've got a premium on it where I closely analyze the book. You can't, you can't win that argument, so don't even try. Just, you know, you can always change the channel. Nobody's forcing you to read that work or, or get into it, right? But as you well, quite same, said, and Sorry to jump okay. in, Michael, but the same thing with female Illuminati. When you first came out with that, everybody's like, what? Female? That's so weird. And you go, oh, no, no. Have you seen the nine-hour presentation that I actually flew to Ireland to do with you on this thing and, and yeah. see what you're talking about? If women ever found out, that a coven of very high level women have been working against them to destroy them to achieve their own power in the world. How would that have an effect? It's not, and it's all and men and everything else, but just like, what, what does that do? That doesn't, dis, uh, that just shows that we, we've known so little about it. And that story goes all the way back to this discussion of the Garden of Eden and the ancient civilizations and the alien visitation and the attraction to the fallen ones and the gods that certain groups had. That really links into this conversation as well, doesn't it? And to what's happening today. Who do you think these Nancy Pelosi's are? Who do you think the uh, most eminent uh, females in power today? Or Marina even, Umbrovich. Or level, but like, <laughs> that's right. Or Gilly. Gilly Maxwell, you know, sort of low level, right? But, but yeah. yeah, significant. Right? So they may be individually low level, but they're part of a network who are much more eminent than them, right? The Queen of England, all of that. And, and another, another princesses and duchesses and stuff like that. So this network definitely exists. People can read the Black Nobility article on the female Illuminati website. It's probably a good starting place. But that group, you see, what they never tell you in the Bible and, and, and other places, they don't want to confess is that in Judea of the ancient world, this cult existed, right? They, but they were diviners, they were seers, they were sibyls. They were, there was even women prophets. Amos the prophet had a wife who was a prophetess. See, they want to downplay all that. that and there was cults, there was priestess cults that have all been, you know, uh, 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 you know, scrubbed from history. But, you, you know, if you dig deep and get into these Queen Helenas, and then like Ralph has done, you know, I cite him in that article, his discoveries about the two, at uh, least two queens of the of the Parthians, right? Queen uh, Helena, uh, you know, the Ab Adabeni and uh, that crowd, right? Uh, you know, the, of the House of Orange, right? This is, you know, what? What's Holland and France got? The, oh, well, there you are then, right? These these Marys and and these other characters, and so that uh, that's just one, by the way. That that um, group that he's talking about, the Parthian Adesan House is uh, one group of a massive, massive order. Right? So that, they're not the ones themselves. They're just one branch because you had it in other areas as well, right? They have it in all the traditions. And that is a very powerful group that still has members today. Uh, and that's why if you really do a deep study of masonry, which we've done, like as you say, in the Female Illuminati program and others, you'll find out that what we normally consider a lot of masculine male symbolism within masonry is nothing of the kind. In fact, you have to go a long way to even find a single masculine symbol. Even in the church, too, with all the right. Jesuits running around in dresses and aprons and all this oh, stuff. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Even the sun that they use is a black sun. They have the IHS, Ikos, again, as I say, Yakos, Ikos, right? That is all connected to Bacchus. Bacchus is nothing more than the child, the, the sun lover of the goddess. So, you know, we've done nine hours, barely scratched the surface, right? <clears throat> but see, it ties back into trauma. Because these female cults had already started before the event I'm going to talk about, but they had no power. They were just a they were just a, a group in Egypt, right? Sort of like the what did the queens and the daughters and the princes of the Pharaoh do, right? Well, they had their own little societies, but those societies were massively empowered by a particular cosmic you know event that happened in the heavens in ancient times, right? And from that came a whole cache, a whole sort of archive of iconography 
that you still see being used today, say the torch, right? The great Palladian or whatever, and the serpent staff and all of this. From this event came a mass, I mean, absolutely hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of symbolic motifs, right? And tropes and customs that the female groups picked up on. But the event itself was traumatic. So there's that, you know, there's been many acts that traumatized us. So earlier on, when you talk about cataclysm of the earth, right? And then in Article 5, you know, heaven, the earth is the article. I talk about this event being a yet another, but it's very special act of trauma. So all of these different, say now you take that event that happened in, in prehistoric times, was fundamental to the priests because the priests were always there to interpret those signs in the sky that the laymen couldn't understand. But it turned out that there was a division between the female priestesses and the male priests about the symbolism because a lot of it looked very different in the eyes of the woman as it did to the you know these male priests so a great split happened that's never been dealt with by any other author except in passing and so in the time of Egypt just after this cosmic event the the cults that already existed really polarized and this is when the female cults then took on an immense power because they actually did interpret some of the symbolism they saw. Just like you see, you know, faces in the clouds today. That's where this all comes from, by the way. This very act that you they call it. Uh, <clears throat> what's the what's the term of it? Can't remember right now. Paranomasia, I think it's called. And when you see cloud, you know, faces and dragons and weird things in the clouds, that actually comes from this moment that I'm talking about. That's how we inherited it because it was so traumatizing that every time we look up, you know, it's like being afraid and then you're always scared of it again and you're always on the outlook for it. Well, this is what everywhere. human happened, right? Yeah, this would happen racially. But to cut the story short, the female priesthood became absolutely immensely powerful and infused and partly rightly so because their interpretations carried more currency. They got it right more, right? And and people started to follow it. And the women said, yeah, that's for us. And a lot of it had to do with eroticism. And, you know, it's where these Allura Caves images come and Tantra sex comes from and yoga. A lot of the things that we would never connect came from a moment when the women's interpretation proved truer than the male cults. I'm cutting up this, you know, way down, right? So this is how the cults first started. Uh, and they gave themselves different names and all the rest of it. And they became highly symbolic. So they're the ones who really own the cash or archive of symbolism that you see turning up in Knights Templars and Masonry. The blazing star, the compass, and the, you know, the whatever, all of the symbolism, the ashlar, you name it, is female symbolism, even the numerology is. And so these guys still exist today, uh, 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 and then they're, they, they control the media. Hollywood and all of these media outlets are really run by women, even though a lot of men tycoons are at front. Don't be fooled by that. This is part of a Dionysian uh, work to try and seduce your mind with, with imagery. It's just a, a twist. It's a very supportive one. It's very supportive to them because this is the real way people are conditioned. When we talked about all the things people aren't doing a few minutes ago, the real reason why they're not doing it and why they get entrained to wear masks and accept the, the, the lie and, and are just itching to show you how conformist they are is because of the subliminal programming through the imagery Right, which expert people of such expertise, I've gone blue in the face trying to exp you know, explain this to people, and this still doesn't register. So they're using symbols in all the movies and numerology and all this stuff to entrain your mind, right? And the, de the deprogramming of that hasn't even started yet. In fact, it could even be worse with all the digital technology and kids staring into their cell phones or whatever. But the esoteric roots of it is that it is primarily a female uh, phenomena of how you manipulate the deep brain, right, with all of the symbolism. And a lot of it is erotic, right? We know that women as models, women as cosmeticians, right? Look how much of our media is the female image, the female body, right? We don't want to get into it all. But obviously you can see that even in the history of art, the image of the woman is predominant. And the, what we would call the mystery of the woman, or I prefer to say the mystique of the woman, right? So this is not bashing anybody. This is extrapolating a science. This is pointing out phenomenologically a particular criminal history that is affecting both men and women. But the thing to mention is this, those women that we're talking about, as you rightly said, don't give a monkey's ass about the women of the world today. And so when women wake up, it's over. When men wake up, yeah, it's not over. But when women wake up to this group and realize how seduced they've been and how their lives and their psyches and their sexuality uh, and their upraising of the, of the newborn, right, the child has all been sabotaged on the semiotic level. They are now aware. So my teaching is to make women aware of what happens on the semiotic, that happens on the subliminal, 
etc right because they're the only ones who can bring up the new generation to be aware of it the man's knowing it is wonderful great mm -hmm. he could write some books on it but the thing is it, it's really for the women to have the emotional reaction where the screens go up and it, now you can't affect me right here i am now sacrosanct and it's for women to go out and you know teach this to other women so this this is something that they understand so they can come back to a state of homeostasis where they're not poisoned and polluted by the stuff coming across the media part of which lowers their um you know uh, their immunity on the psychic level so that they then buy into all the other slop that you know frankfurt school uh, and kgb central want to pour into their brains and uh, unfortunately it's reaching you know critical mass right now so that's my thesis. The, the, the Dragon Mother thesis starts at the very semiotic level, carries through the Oedipal, you know, all the way up and, and all the rest of it. There's a follow-up book as well and several article, articles, about 10 articles now extrapolating every detail of this. No stone is left unturned. You know, so, uh, yeah, by all means, come and try to attack it. I'm ready for you. <laughs> well said. Well, I mean, I've kept you for a long time, Michael. I just have one question that popped into my head and, this might be a little stomach churning for some people, but it's a it's a subject that I think it, you know it's hitting critical mass. Everybody's talking about it, and I wondered how it may have related to some of the female cults. Um, whether they're you know by female cults, you also have to remember there are males that are involved in that. It's a it's just this it's these ancient cults that were really into the blood, the the thing with children, that whole thing. Um, Phil Schneider in that uh, episode or that talk that he gave. This was in 95, he gave this talk. And in that talk, he actually talks about this thing called adrenochrome, which is now coming out through all the stuff with Hollywood and these weird rituals that they do and all this stuff about, you know, having um, young children and they use these scimitars to cut the feet so they get the blood and the whole, it's just horrible. It's horrible to get into, but it's there and it's coming out and I'm sitting there going, what's really behind this? It's not modern. It's not something Hollywood people came up with. It's not something some elites came up with. This is ancient uh, ritual that has to do with religion and cults. And I looked into cults and you get into the weird wacko stuff they were doing to people. Uh, these these uh, cults in Brazil, these female cults in Brazil that were kidnapping children, torturing them for days on end, um, and then literally consuming them. Like it's just, again, it's stomach churning, but it's something that's there. And then when you think, pause on that for a second, and you think, well, look at these organizations like Planned Parenthood with Margaret Sanger and these types of people who are literally creating an entire paradigm for women to start uh, getting into the mindset that being pregnant can be just like a handbag where, you know, obviously there's extreme scenarios there, but there's a sticky debate about it. And there's millions and millions and millions of children being shown up as if people, women are just going to a, a mall kiosk and just going, yeah, I don't want the kid. All right, boom, see you later. And it's, it's horrific practice. And, um, and there's, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff behind this. So the whole, the blood drinking, the adrenaline, the adrenaline that, that is used. They've talked about this for years in these magical rituals that they look for the adrenaline, they get high off it. Um, and what Phil Schneider was saying was that the thing with adrenochrone is also having to do with these subterranean and beings and the sacrificing and all that. So, I mean, wherever people fall into it, I just wanted to throw that one at you, Michael, about, um, cause I know you did a section in the female Illuminati on, uh, some of the ways that these covens would get together and align their, uh, menstrual cycles with the moon cycles and the whole thing. And they would use all these different potions. And a lot of it was pulled from, you know, animals, humans, and it was to empower them psychically or something. Did, did you have any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it's all gone into <clears throat> spirit cooking is a real thing, by the way. Uh, the, the precise uh, sacrifice of a child and where the f flesh of that child is uh, consumed. Uh, let's take it. We've done that so thoroughly in other areas. We maybe take another tack. When these celestial traumas took place that modern civilizations started to develop, you had really boogaloo cults. It was women cults and it was men, but just let's talk in general. Say an Orphic cult, say a cult of Adonis or a cult of uh, Priapus or Pan or what, whatever you've got. When these uh, processions, right, they'd have a, like a 50, I don't know, 10 foot, you know, phallus and they carry it through the streets, right? When they, uh, when they had the Maenads and the Bacchanalia, right, which is a very inc incredible, we think uh, these things that you're talking about are horrific. Try a thousand women, a thousand women pouring into a valley to just tear the flesh off bulls and cows and devour the meat raw, roll around in the mud, 
scream, scream and yell, right? and, and just do it for days on end until it, you couldn't even imagine a blood, a Slayer video wouldn't even come close. Right? Horrific stuff, and everybody salutes it. That's a you know secret, secret. They're they're off there today, and this was happening everywhere amongst the Phrygians, right, and on all the rest of it. And it's important because these are the kind of proto-religion things that later on, you know, things like the Eucharist came out of, right? Things that look all sanitized and, and goodly. Shit, you have no idea where that crap came from, right? So I, I prefer to always look at it from their point of view. That's why my commentary is, you know, comes in. Why do that? What? Why the phallus? The phallus is a female symbol then, not a male one. Right. How do, you, how do you work that out? Is because we touched on it one time before when I said that the king is the ritual sacrifice. When you really study kingship as it applied in, in places like Egypt, uh, when it was applied in Africa, when it was applied in even Ireland, right? The king will reign for a certain amount of time and then he has to give up his life. A lot of people don't realize that that's fact. Osiris is the archetype. But the king embodies our Osiris, he's the living Osiris, and he must give up his life. So in the early days of kingship, that's what they did. They took you out after seven years of purification, and that was it, mate. You were dead. A lot of people don't realize this. You know, or they'd burn you in the wicker man or whatever that is, right? Uh, different cultures had their different ways of doing it. You know the old story about hemlock? You know, Socrates just given a glass of hemlock and drank it and died. Right. It could be just like that, but you were going down, you were dead, because the whole fate of your race and nation depended upon your blood being spilled. But the part that is also important in this is that the son, the pharaoh, is only the son of the goddess. So if he's 50, 14, 25, 65, it doesn't matter. He's the son of the goddess being sacrificed. This is the key thing. He's the bull god that they stab and sacrifice. He's the leopard god, right? He's the sacrificial animal. As time came, as time moved on, and it's cutting a long story short. It turned out that in the end, they weren't actually physically killing off the king. What they do is they scar him or mark him. You know all those? You, you, how many Ethiopian and Kenyan group? You know, tribesmen. These chiefs have these markings on their face, right? They all went through circumcision. Circumcision's origin is this: we're going to take you know the tip of your phallus off because instead of killing you, right? Other Would it be similar to of, the uh, the mutilation of the female genitalia as well, which was a big thing? I can't remember what, how that fits in. Uh, let's not go there yet. I, I don't want to say on you know things that are false. Uh, I would I would look at more the oppression of women, right? Uh, but that takes us in a different direction. I'm doing work on that, but just sticking with the male figure. This is a, oh, I will say that it, all of this is a goddess ritual, by the way. It's all for the sake of the goddess, right? Now, all of these races that did this, from the steppes of Russia, the Scythians were fucking mad on it. Jesus fucking Christ, you have no idea. You think things today are bad, right? All of these races who did these kinds of periodical bacchanalias, right, which were just monstrous in terms of what we would know, they were doing it because the trauma of what nature had happened to them terrestrially had scared the shit out of them that in order to appease the gods that they would never revisit, right? That's what's in the Bible with God and his rainbow. They said, we have to have the leader sacrifice himself. So now you start to see how logical, right? This is not an evil or corrupt thing. They're saying, we have to do it because, you know, that whole thing about the, uh, the, the, the Aztecs cutting out the heart of the, of the leaders and all this, right. right? That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. But primarily what is not known is that the king was a king because he was the sacrifice. Because he, during his kinship in the younger days, he was prepared for it. He was purified for it. And then all the treasures, he would give wine, women, whatever you want, you know, before the day. Big cigar, you know, whatever you want, right? And then you're gonna, we're going to kill you, right? So this is actually a fact, right? Later on, the ritual changed where they weren't actually killing the fucker. They would just mark him in some way or, you know, he'd have a castration, full-blown castration, you know, some ritualistic thing. And then that phallus, the castrated phallus, was what was carried to. So it wasn't a male cult of patriarchs like these lying feminist people say, you know, the ones who are in favor of matriarchy, trying to make out Indo-Europeans and other groups to look like crazy, right? No, no, no. In every one of those cases, it was the goddess thinking that was behind it and the carrying of the penis. In the rites of Adonis, just like you see these men in Spain, you know, running down the street with the bulls chasing them and sticking the horns up their arse and all this, right, and jumping over the bulls, going crazy. Right. 
that is a tiny that's a tiny version of a ritual that used to happen in Italy during the period of the what's known the rites of Adonis in which men would run down the streets with sharp knives cut off their own penises and sh and throw them into the houses of women into Jesus. the halls just so you know <laughs> what, the fuck? what are and you doing that, this weekend penis, man that, oh they did it to their own kids right the the women would pick up the phalluses and put them in cauldrons or, or glasses uh, chalices it's where the whole holy grail thing ties in right and i don't even want to even go further with that but this was a classic ritual by which you sacrificed your phallus because the blood would be taken and poured on the land or the grapes and the water turned to wine it's a grape it's a bacchanalia it's a it's a dionysian festival but it's all born out of this terrestrial trauma which if you study it like i've done meticulously you find out a lot of things later on that come about so the trauma is still in the mind of the modern today. Therefore, it is not that difficult with some right handling, some right TV programs and subliminal education, and somebody like, you know, this Abramovich leading the way. She's a priestess. She's casting herself like that to say, uh, in our cult, it is quite right for ritual sacrifice because it's all based in keeping the world turning. It's all based in prosperity. It's all based in the land and the grapes growing, right? And all their symbolism they're showing. So when you see these blood spattered models and you see blood dripping from everywhere and from kids and all this stuff, it doesn't have anything to do with Satanism. It's got to do with female menstrual rituals. The child comes from my womb, my blood, and I have the right to take it back because although the child is not umbilically collected to me, he is. That child came from my body, is a part of my body, and I can have it back anytime I want, right? Because I am the Alpha and the Omega. And it's the menstrual blood rituals. And as you said quite rightly, yes, there's a whole thing about uh, the caves. The uh, drugs are a huge part of this, but it's drugs that are prepared. Soma, they called it, right? And they call it other names in other work, in other cultures. But the Soma from Celtic Ireland onwards, this was a concoction that was based in herbs that had to be picked at the right time of the moon uh, and also the, the phases of Venus was very involved and it was precisely for 200 or more thousand years the women were the keepers of this medicinal stuff and also of astrology and astronomy they invented it women invented mathematics that's why the word ma is in it representing the ma goddess mat mayat all mathematics astronomy measurement time calendar is all based in female symbols right as you'll see if you know what you're looking at even on architecture so and they did it because of these rituals that they would do where they'd make these concoctions out of these various herbs all the details are in the female illuminati program uh and th then they would imbibe it and they would also give it to their the chosen son lover uh and and then at a certain time of the child's life and each culture had a different uh, period for this as a point came where the child see it was a son lover you got to understand this part and the son lover would mate with his own mother ancestrally, but they'd do it only after a, a very elaborate ritual, which involved taking these concoctions, right? And that's secreted in, you know, the, the whole idea of, of Aphrodite and, uh, 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 and, uh, and Adonis, or Eros, sorry, right? It's all covered up, of course, and it got more covered up as time went by. But in the ritual, the, the mother consumes the, uh, seminal fluid of of her own child etc right don't want to get more elaborate than that but crazy in that oh yeah in that it was all done very ritualistically right a lot of stuff is involved in this uh but then it was their sharing it was it was both of them becoming one being right and not to mention it was initiation into his kinghood but he was basically the wounded king it's where the fisher king idea comes in and all this he's he this was considered a wounding because after he had mated with his mother, he was celibate from that moment on. And part of the ritual, you know, he would never be with anybody else. Uh, and also sometimes it did include the genital you know, mutilation. His phallus would be cut off at that point. And, and it was willingly because he's already met with the goddess, the mother goddess. So this is a perfectly female cult that had this as a very central ritual. And, and even to get to this, I have to cut off so much stuff that was involved. So later on today, what we're seeing is the media, it's a really weird thing, but it's the virtual version of the same thing with all these, you know. Uh, well, and there are these cults that have taken these practices in the, in, the, in the forms that would have been originally done in these times, right? 
and they've probably taken them in. And if they just want to do these rituals for purposes of gaining power, as opposed to just keeping the world turning and we can get into all the details of that, then you're going to see corruptions of it. You're going to see, um, you know, and then you have all these pedophiles and all these people that are just attracted to the power and the whole rituals. And they don't know what the real shit's going on at the top, but they're just drawn. And I mean, look at these Lady Gaga types who is a, a student, a protege of people like Abramovich. Um, you know, and you see the symbolism in That's their right. music videos and they're the whole the thing, right? It's a big cult. They're in the cult. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, Beyonce and all the rest of them, Lady Gaga especially, all of that symbolism must be decoded. But the thing is, it must be decoded correctly. When Christians come at it, they're nowhere. Right. Satan, Satan, Satan. Look, the female priestess wore the fucking horns. I mean, we could just, you know, it's... Uh, you know, they, ad they address it, and I believe they're well-meaning. But if you don't have the keys of decipherment, it can do as much damage as it can do good. It is good that these people are coming out in the media and showing and being more obvious about it, right? Uh, and that's really good because you can then decode it, right? And there's a lot to decode. But it's all female symbolism, all of it. Even if there's a Marilyn Manson on the front or whoever, it's basically female symbolism that you're seeing. And all the blood is that. It's, it's nothing to do with Satanism. It's to do with ancient races who were trying to galvanize their psyche, placate the earth, right? So it is paganism and sacrifice a very important figure or his phallus or uh, you know in some other way they would do it uh, you know symbolically and they've resurrected this and we've explained why it's atavistic right it's a word people should understand the the, the female has been feminized herself right way beyond the masculine you know paradigm of western woman she doesn't realize that the prime rituals in the world today that are really evil are directed on women's consciousness not men the man goes down if the doomsday weapon is woman, but the attacks are on women. So you can't make women understand this because they have no interest in their psychology, which is one of the uh, by, one of the you know happy phenomena of what we're talking about. They've been conditioned not to give a shit about who they are. Just keep shopping and all the rest of it, right? So this is they all got to stop. So the man is indeed uh, endangered, but he is not the endangered species that they're working on. These cults don't give a shit about women. They're including women and mothers in this ritual. And by proxy, the newborn. But they're also using the atavistic stuff that we're talking about in our history is in women's minds because women were part of all of these rituals in the past. So don't you see those video images, why they're doing it vid vid visually and why they're doing it uh, uh, virtually? Is they're trying to awaken something that is atavistic in the woman whose genes, right, and whose racial memory, this was okay in those days when women did these rituals. How do you awaken that in the modern woman unless you have these gory, horrific images with the media behind it, which is the Dionysian cult, hugely funding it and putting it up everywhere. So the girls change their looks, right? They start dressing differently, they have their attitudes. That's a, that's a ritual. <clears throat> it's a mass ritual. Even though it may look it's coming through a political thing or a rock video or a music video, don't be fooled, right? So this, the five-pointed star is a female symbol. The horse, the black horse, which turns up in countless of these videos, all of these symbols, right, are female symbols. And they're awakening atavistic memory by which the woman returns to this bacchanalian aspect. Can't you see that that's what's happening? Their attacks on men is that tearing apart of the bull or tearing apart of the child or the dismembering of the child, right? Yeah, there's Masonic backing to this, but the men are the acolyte. The, the male lodges, you know, are, are lower tiers of the super cults, even the Knights Templar. You wouldn't believe it. We, you know, and I've got into that in the female website, female Illuminati website, how the Templars serve this group. They're castrata, even the undergarments that they wear, the whole thing. We don't want to get into all this, right? But it's all been done. But these Masons and their rituals are being twice born or thrice born. Christians don't have a clue what that's all about, right? These are purely female rituals, right? Ralph Ellis's work on, on the House of Parthia, but that House of Parthia is just one of many royal houses that spread throughout the world. And, uh, you know, it's not to say that there wasn't positive. Remember in the female Illuminati, we talk about the females who were good, the good priestesses versus the evil ones, right? So uh, it, by no means is this bashing. This is just a history lesson. Women can be as offended as you fucking like. I couldn't care less. I'm looking at the world burning here. So you can be as offended as you want to be, right? This must. This information must get out. It must get out there. You cannot call it bashing. You cannot call it misogyny. 
if you do then i'm sorry you know you might as well just go and have some more lattes and watch some more soap operas or something because you're not part of it and you're part of the problem and therefore you have nothing but my contempt because as you said if this attack was done on women strategically and occult, for occult reasons um then they know how powerful that real the god the real goddess the good feminine element is in helping to maintain balance in civilization and in the world and obviously for this project of trying to pursue freedom in in you know the west uh if they want to disrupt that you have to go through the long march of the institutions and you have to colonize the minds of the major influences if i look at many men today they have to check in with the wife before they even do anything right and that's because of the culture and that's because there isn't a balance. And I'm not saying that, you know, it's just, if you think about it, men are going to go, you know what? Yeah, I don't think I can do that. I don't, I'm not going to go along with what you're saying because I'm going to get heat from upstairs. And you go, wait a minute, you don't think for yourself? Like, why not have a conversation with your wife about this? Why not bring it together and have a real uh, discussion about it? And so Look you, at the you hipsters. Have... The hipsters can't even get a girl. They're, they're consulting their cappuccinos. <laughs> and looking at the world right i mean we're dying and that's all part of it that's right. all part of it see the thing is that the female who has allowed all of this degeneration to take place have to face the idea it's not going to be easy to restore it doesn't mean it can't be restored but without factoring in female psychology it's not going to happen there's no political remedy here right uh, and so there needs to be a zeitgeist change in which women sincerely, right, following the, the you know, the women that I cite in my books that uh, on this subject, that they start following, you know, and that's what my work is. The, the websites, the articles is all about trying to kindle that interest, <clears throat> which has never really been there since the advent of psychology, except for a very, very small demographic. Women have 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 scorned. The subject of psychology and are only interested in the most uh, dr phil and minus level you got some crazy teen that needs a bit of a you know head shrinker and all that look that, you know so it's not that there are no remedies it's not that there's no remedies there are very they're very powerful but it's for women to pick it up and then men will follow men will you know because remember as we've expressed it in other work the mother is the one who controls the semiotic level this is the pre-edible period, which only lasts months, by the way, right? Uh, it's pre-symbolic, you know, in, in the structure that, and this is all from a feminist, this is a feminist structure that was uh, created to analyze uh, the woman's effect on, on their children. And that semiotic level is pre-rational, it's pre-symbolic, right? So if I go to you like that, or I go to you like that, that's symbolic, and you know what I mean, right? Before we understand language and before we understand some symbolism, there is a very primeval uh, 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 area of consciousness in the, child, in the newborn child that's called semiotic, in which it's all of these other structures, higher up structures, but in a very, very loose and condensed and, and vaguer way, right? And central, the central icon that sits in the center of the child's world when it's in the semiotic abyss. Is the is the image of the not just the image of the mother the body of the mother the very physicality her scent you know her her presence her her accoutrements uh, uh you know her skin temperature the mother dominates sound like some massive thing. goddess huh i was just saying the voice the sound the the, the sound oh, of the God mother's Almighty, voice yes. is, just yeah. right just like it is with a blind animal right and therefore centuries upon centuries of information uh, is being conveyed to the child's mind in the semiotic. Everything else is derivative, everything else is later, and everything else is far less important to the consciousness of a child. The real structuring of the psyche happens in the semiotic level. Almost no psychologist in the world ever deals with it. So there's a fault all of the 20th century as well. It's a deficiency, right? But the point is that that's where the child's real seeds of feminization are planted. And so culture then and societies on the top try to masculinize, you know, this whole problem, uh, issue of masculinization, not a problem, it's a good thing. <clears throat> As the child passes through, you know, through the Oedipal complex into adulthood, they're masculinizing themselves. But the, the, the witchery that's going on today and the sorcery is that if those cultures and civilizations can become feminized, 
which is what the Marcuse and politics and communism is doing. Don't you see? The structure, you know, like a plant growing needs that bamboo cane. If that bamboo cane turns to a noodle, how can you masculinize the child? So the semiotic awaits. Well, the child doesn't either leave the semiotic, you can look at it that way, you know, across what's called the thetic into the symbolic, or it collapses back into the, the abyss. Uh, I, I portrayed it both ways. Because, because the main fact is, that's it, masculinizing dead. And so the constant assault on patriarchy, right, and it, you know all the entitlement of these flunkies in, in, the, in the left, the women, as is just uh, supporting what I said about how they are the culprits, their attacks on the solar masculine patriarchal world are bankrupt. And I give five, six clear bullet points, unarguable, non-negotiable proofs of this, right, in, in the book, The Follow-Up Adultism. So... We are now at a cultural state in which we're moving closer and closer back to the semiotic. And all the things you just talked about, about the Abramoviches and all these ritualistic things, that, that plugs in as part of it. So when you have the celeb and when you have these nut, these flunkies, you know, uh, walking on the red carpet, making the latest videos, they're, they're permeated with female symbolism that works primarily on the female and then works on the child. It's all semiotic symbolism uh, Symbolism to bypass, well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a semiotic iconography to bypass the symbolic, the rational, and the masculine. And that, to me, is the key of what's happening. Although, in the, in the great circus of it, you know, it's all it seems to be discombobulated, different voices and all, right? But your operas and all of it, once you know how to decode it, it's done. The job is done. It's not that hard. I may have worked for 30 fucking years or whatever to, to build up this knowledge. But when the person gets it, they gets it in 30 seconds. They can get it in 30 minutes, 30 days. And then now you're onto it and you can't be infected. But since women are the ones who are breeding the new generation of children, it's up to them really to, you know, take this to heart and realize that they're in charge of the semiotic level. What comes later is important, eh, but not ultimately uh, as important as the roots of child consciousness, which is semiotic. And then from that point, you know, you move from there into other interesting aspects as well, uh, which I've gone into on the Dragon Mother site primarily, right? There's articles there that take it in a different direction, even from what we're talking about now. But that semiotic level is dominated by the woman, not the man. The father has no influence at all for what is hundreds of years of, of development in psychic terms. So when the Jesuit said, give me a child when he's seven years, hey, try seven months. And I'll make the man. Hey, wrong. It's happening in seven weeks, seven months. But it's so, you know, when the world comes online, uh, the, the child adapts and mirrors, you know, and goes through that whole process. But actually, and it's what these, why I'm going into this is because this is what the sorcerers understand. And you must understand it. You know, the world must understand this because they understand it. This is how they're doing it. This is how they can stab you in the back. They know the psychology you don't know. They know that once you've got that child semiotic, level, you know, uh, uh, polluted, poisoned, and that's done through the mother, uh, you know, the, the terrible mother, particularly, you've won. And then to back it up, to hasten the process, you feminize the, the solar society, which was the one that was going to, the plant was going to grow high and tall and strong. You weaken that, you poison that. And f if you've got, you know, you've got the, the bottom and the below, and there's just a collapse in between. And you got the hipster, you got the snowflake running wild, having orgasms in the street. Yeah, you look at them in New Zealand now, in Australia, crawling around, yelling and screaming with their masks on. All oh, while the government of those places, by the way, I'm getting messages from people all over the world saying it's literally like Nazi Germany level of checkpoints. You can go out for an hour worse. a day. Uh, it's getting worse and worse and worse. And so you go, you see that cult. Isn't it interesting that places like Australia, New Zealand, there's certain places that it was as if they were the first test cases they were the first places that were the weakest that didn't resist any of this and brought in all this left-wing stuff into their culture. And that was weak enough so that when this crisis hit, this random thing that just jumped out of nowhere, uh, then they can go, oh, they're softened up and they'll take it and they'll do what they're fucking told like the slaves that they are. And now it's like, whoa, how quick did that happen? You know what I mean? And I'm afraid, I'm afraid it is a, a demonstrable fact that the first ones to be sticking on the masks and conforming were women. Right? People can argue and about shaming why. shaming all the people, and, and, right? Uh, uh, absolutely. So these small anecdotes that people see shouldn't be treated as any misogynist statement. They should be f just accepted as pragmatic fact of a psyche 
that's in ruins, a psyche that has slowly been poisoned and eroded from what it originally was. Women are the main target. So damn the person who calls me a misogynist. I'm doing this for women. I remember even in 2004 when Origins and Oracle started, there was two programs in there that were on the divination and the goddess and the astrotheology and lauding the female in her masculine mode. The, the priestesses that brought the wisdom we've talked about just now, but instead of you know turning it for evil purposes, those DVDs, and they're multi-length DVDs, and that doesn't include other presentations that I've done, that celebrated right what women brought in terms of herbalism and astronomy and all. So you're picking on the wrong character. Go find somebody else to you know to uh, intimidate because you're not going to intimidate me. Well, we need and to I see where the weak points are. We need to see where this went. Years. Exactly. We need to see where this all went wrong. And it went wrong. And then well, what, what's with wrong. the men who don't do anything either? Like, you know, it's everywhere. You got to go, all right, this is, and then that's why we go, okay, all these subjects we've brought, we brought so much. So this is one of the greatest interviews we've done. I think they're all great, but holy shit, we did so much today. Uh, this all comes together when you think about it like this. Humanity and the earth had its own natural trajectory. Something interfered, whether you can call it catastrophe, invasion, um, you know, whatever, something changed. And then these priesthoods and priestess groups grew out of that trauma, started creating these separations with the religions and the cults and the whole thing, created the whole architecture of control in ancient times. That is what is uh, used and referenced by the architecture of control in modern times. And it attacks men in a certain way. It attacks women in a certain way. And it attacks children in a certain way to keep us in what? In general, to keep us completely divided, not just as a group, as a, as a civilization, but divided internally, to keep us completely psychically divided within so that we're mutilated and we're weakened. Therefore, we're primed and ready. It's like what I was covering in my last episode where I was talking about all this mask stuff and all this stuff, it's a, it's a, it's a ritual. They're trying to make you a blank slate, a tabula rasa, so that they can then re-imprint you and prep you for the new world they want for you. Mm -hmm. We didn't vote this in. We didn't do this. We, you know, you hear Phil Schneider telling us, hey, we got to do something where freedom isn't worth anything. And then they kill the guy yeah. and they kill all the people that say this. Um, is that, but, but we have to do it anyways. We have to realize what matters and what can we do about it. We ha the problem is we're trusting the wrong people. We're trusting known liars, criminals, psychopaths, and incompetents. We're giving our power away to them. So what someone like you has been saying, Michael, that I noticed right away was you don't have to be part of a new group. We don't have to start a new religion. You can do this yourself. You can do what Krishnamurti said. You can unslave yourself. If you start there, mothers and fathers of the world, then you can help free the minds of your children, which will then create the future generations that might make something worth living in. If we don't do that, it's all the nightmares of all the dystopic movies, the equilibriums and all these kinds of things that are going to come in. And these people are ready for that and they want that. So we don't have to go along with it. And like you said, with the legalese, I love that you brought that in. You're more powerful than you think, even within the system, even within the legal system, you have way more power than they're telling you. The media is telling you, oh, it's illegal to go to the park with your kid. Fuck them. It's bullshit. Uh, so you just got to, you know, no. yeah, that, that, that you sue that person civilly. 100%. And I mean, you actually do it. You get your lawyer to sue them. The letter is handed to them by an agent of the of the court, and they end up in the fucking civil court having to defend themselves. Who did you, who, who offended you? Who hurt you? Habeas corpus and all the rest of it. They will never fuck with you again, right? And this includes an institution. Say you're dealing with PayPal or Amazon or any of these fucking Googles. Once your law firm hits them with even a civil suit, it's red carpet all the way, mate. They go to the low hanging fruit right away. I call, you say, oh, yes. What's the fax number of your legal department? Big pause. As the customer service, a word that should never have been introduced into the world. <laughs> My legal department, what do you want that for? Yes, their number, their phone number, address, or fax of your legal department. Another pause. Yeah, uh, my lawyer. Uh, is going to, you know, however you want to phrase it, say, well, my legal team will be in contact with them over this matter since it's not being resolved. It'll be resolved right there and then. And even if it goes a few steps further, it costs 50 bucks, have the fucking lawyer send a goddamn fucking, you know, cease and desist or why are you not helping my client? Why, why is he being given a runaround? He's paying you, you're not paying him. 
show me the statutes by which this whole thing has you know glitched him or glitched her or whatever you know give me your uh, you know your uh, terms and conditions which my client has violated that's the last time in the history of your life that that company's ever going to fuck with you okay i'm done i can't make it any simpler so no you don't have to go along with it and you can go on the attack but i always say do it with extreme cordiality and dispassion because that will end up empowering you even more than ranting and raving and trying to get into the political pigsty and all the rest of it. You'll empower yourself this way. So I'm not talking about just something of pushing papers and become a lawyer. In fact, I'm talking about something that will empower you spiritually. It's a masculine thing to do it, heroic. And you know, we've got to get it out of our minds that we're completely, utterly powerless legalistically. That's that's crucial. And then the psychology, all the things we've unpacked. And uh we are we have now living through a year in which my god the revelations you know uh, are, are more clear about our enemy you know know that enemy what tools are using they're, they're exposing that's themselves more conspicuous there that's it that is a good thing so no need for trauma no need to you know feel that, uh, that things are just desperate you know uh you know I, I i don't have any of that energy at all and so when you when you're rooted in intelligence right it, it, it really is something else now's the time to test your metal now's the time to go to war but you go to war against people who are basically conditioned semiotically you know you have to know what's wrong with the the person you're going against and the last thing you want to do is come at them with non-psychological knowledge we've given those anecdotes before about say you do a mark dyson you shove a microphone into their face they'll win basically and or at least they hold their ground unless you're able to call them neurotics or constitutional moral inferiors, or, or how long have you suffered from, you know, psychosis? You know, uh, how long have you been a beta person? You know, uh, do you always dislike alpha people when they talk to you? You know, you, you've got to use this to, and then this deer in headlights. That's how you unground them. It is by undermining their psychological profile. You know, are you on medication? How long, how long have you been on medication? You know, your eyes are dilated, you know, like this. You, you hit them where it hurts the most to under under to strip off their mask you know like with a with a with a corrosive but coming at them with on the same fucking level that they're on you know that's that's totally facile and as as people by now can probably guess my my recommendation is don't bother ever getting in touch with them because they're so fucking toxic you'll you'll not come out too good but if you have to and you're in that mode then you must come as a psychologically empowered person you know uh like I said, how much destructiveness, uh, have you noted how much destructiveness is in your philosophy? It's a philosophy of destruction, you know, um, and, and, and you know, relevant things like that. And you can do that to anyone, medics, police, whatever. You know, there's no need for any losing of the rag or anything like that. It's always to be done in a methodical and calm way. You know, in fact, even using a lower tone voice, like speaking lower than normal, has a tremendous hypnotic effect to disable these lunatics, right? But raving and ranting and coming at them, you know, all gung-ho, they're ready for that. You know, one of the things they'll do is when they see one of their people under attack like that, 15 of them come around with their fucking cell phones out. They're so conformist. They're like, you know, taking video of you as if, as if that means anything. Uh, but it can intimidate you if you are stupid enough to come at them that way. But if you're just having a dialogue, looking them right in the eyes, you know, and, and then you, you have a psychological sort of repartee, uh, repartee with them that undermines their ego, they'll, they'll get up and leave, and they'll be very uncomfortable. After you, you know, they're gone, they'll, they'll not be comfortable listening and remembering what you just said. Do you come from a single parent, parent home? Single mother, perhaps? Where's dad, right? Things like that. And you're taking psychologically, so you're taking the wind out of them, right? Where it really counts. It's like a kind of a verbal Aikido. That, that's, these are just small skills I'm throwing out there that people need to develop so that uh, you're not fooled by them. They're, you know, you don't play the game by the tools. I've said this from the Atlantis books onwards. Never fight the fight with the tools that they've handed you. That's a fail. That's an absolute guarantee of failure. That's why I recommend these other things that we've done. But yeah, great. Let's do it again. Thanks so much for the time. Oh. I mean, there's really a lot there for people to handle, but you know, these are the crucial times where concentrated doses of knowledge, you know, there's no other way. We have to dispense it, regardless of those people who, you know, find it 
a bit overpowering and everything. But yeah, but you know, this is a critical time in a way. I, I see it as all good, by the way. But you know, because I'm looking at big pictures in terms of the takedown of some real monsters like communism and all. So I'm I'm always focused on that. Uh, you know, what's happening in Hong Kong and all of that preoccupies me. India waking up and, and ditching communism. There's some beautiful things happening. There really is. So you know, I, I try to focus on that. But again, mate, mate, thanks a lot. Oh, thank you. I mean, wow, this was great. We went is three and a half hours. Brilliant um, show. And for those listening, Michael and I do this every week on Unslaved. We have guests. We do presentations on all the different things. This is. Can you believe that three and a half hour podcast was only scratching the surface of all these subjects? That's what is really right. mind blowing. So just remember that. And I did have a qu one quote I wanted to bring up. I always bring it up in this conversation, especially when we're getting into this idea of otherworldly beings, a bigger universe. It's a quote that always um, helped expand my mind. I actually owe uh, gratitude to, uh, he's passed away now, but Rob, Bob Dean, he was another whistleblower that came out. I know he I was a big Bob. guy in, in your life as well, Michael. Um, yep, he did yep, it in one of his presentations. Guy. I've kept this quote with me since. It comes from Giordano Bruno, who was another guy who was killed trying to shape and came from within the church. And he said this, he said, innumerable suns exist. Innumerable earths revolve around these and living beings inhabit these worlds. And it was, a, a, there was a shock to the system back in flat earth day in a uh, Gnostic world of demiurges and all this, where you had somebody coming out from within the priest class saying, hey, we're not the only ones. There's a bigger universe out there. The creative force of the universe is not limited to this one little speck of dust in the Milky Way. There's all this other stuff going on. There's been influences from afar. There's a different science that can explain everything. And what do they do? They drag him down to the court. They cut out his tongue and they burn him alive. And that's what they do to people that are these maverick free thinkers. Um, so today it's censorship and cutting off your income streams and slandering you. And yeah, probably hauling you off in prison. Uh, back in the day, they used to torture you publicly. And so uh, let's be grateful for the fact that here we are with all the stuff going on. Michael and I can come on. Other guests that I've had on uh, can, and other shows that are doing this can come on and have these conversations to expand your mind. And we're not trying to tell you what to think. We're just asking that you think in general for yourself. So uh, thank you, Michael. Thanks to all the amazing people. We got some super chats in there. Amazing uh, commentary. I'm going to go back and read through it. And we'll definitely do it again sometime. And go hit us up, unslave.com. We've got hundreds and hundreds of hours of high-level content that you won't find anywhere else. So thanks, everybody. We'll catch you next time. Cheers.